Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Federico Stella. I'm a student of computer engineering here at the University of Bologna. I'm also a student of Colegio Superiore, which is an institution that, that organized this event. And I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to first thank you, thank you guys, everybody, for being here, because it's the first time I organized something like this. So I really appreciate your participation. And okay, just a couple of uh, Thanks, I have to say, uh, first to the director of Colegio Superiore, which is Professor Beatrice Pravoni, to the guests, of course, for being here. Uh, without them, it wouldn't have been possible. And to uh, the administrative staff of Colegio Superiore, to Professor Matteo Cerri, Professor Michela Milano, who's sitting back there, and the Department of Computer Science and, and Engineering for the sponsorship and helping the organization of the event. And I also have to thank the students of Colegio Superiore for supporting me with this, especially Paola Biagi, who really helped me a lot and is a student representative for the organization of the events. And, okay, so enough of this. And we can start by saying that uh, Colegio Superiore is the excellent institution of the University of Bologna, and it groups together some students that are admitted to an admission test. And uh, there's a lot of schools like this in Italy. <coughs> Sorry. And the students of these schools are grouped together uh, with an association, and the name of the association is RIASISU. RIASISU organizes each year a series of conferences uh, about a specific topic, and this year's topic is posthumous enhancement. And this uh, event, this conference, is the event of Bologna for this topic, for this year. Okay, so. Uh, just a couple of things about the event, how it will be structured. There will be four talks by our speakers, and after each talk, you will be able to ask questions if you have some. Um, maybe just try to ask maybe short questions, brief questions, and if you have longer questions that you think are, can be more interesting for the speakers <coughs> to talk maybe between each other or for you to debate a bit with the speaker, you can keep them for the final panel discussion. Uh, we will try to to do this panel discussion, in which also you guys are invited to take part, if you have something to say. Um, okay, so I think we can start. I didn't forget, forget anything. Uh, okay, so our first uh, speaker is Professor Matteo Cerri, here. And he, is, he graduated in medicine, and he then went on to become, uh, to become a researcher, and is now an assistant professor here at the University of Bologna. He's also a member of the Italian Institute for Nuclear Physics and of the European, he also works for the European Space Agency on the topic of hibernation. And this is also the topic he's going to talk about today. So please welcome Professor Lattocelli. Inviting me, that's always a pleasure, and um, so it was very hot. So I had to take my sweater <laughs> and please try to not fall asleep. I know he is a sleep promoter, so and also we get some lack of oxygen eventually. Well, a little bit. So, so we're already testing some kind of physiological hibernation in the room, and we'll see maybe at the end of the day someone will fall. Um, I don't know if you can all see, I have kind of a dark slide, so maybe in the sun the earth was going down a little bit, but um, yes, my, my topic is hibernation, and which usually you know, trickle some interesting question. Uh, we all used to think of hibernation uh, for space travel, and I'm sure you are familiar with this kind of uh, movie, there are frames from famous science fiction story, you can try and challenge your your knowledge about um, maybe theater culture and try to identify it. But um, hibernation was used in this years, for instance, science fiction for multiple purposes. So uh, you can travel very fast, very far, sorry, and to a different planet or a galaxy or whatever. Um, or you can uh, time travel. <coughs> there are many stories in which hibernation is used to traveling in the future. You kind of are forgotten, hibernated, and then you wake up years later. Or you can uh, eventually live in kind of a digital heaven or, or universe or whatever you, whatever you want to call it. Um, and this is science fiction, and so far it's been always been science fiction. 
Um, but lately, there, uh, there, there's, there's some issues, some, some interesting news that they can take us to, to see whether there's any scientific base to this topic. And uh, so someone called a donation for you on for this kind of space project called Hypersleep. I'm using this word now because it's kind of in the pop culture and we'll change it later to a more technical and appropriate uh, term. Um, but it's a long story. There's a long story in humanity. This is John Hunter. He's a British physiologist. Um, he uh, inspired the figure of Dr. Dolittle, if you remember the story. Uh, he was a brilliant scientist and one of the maybe first to be kind of modern and repeat and systematically try to observe it and, and do experiments. And he was convinced of something. He was convinced that heat was actually uh, the life essence of every person. Uh, a flow, a life flow of heat was could, could be captured, could be transferred to one person to another. And then he tried all his life to you know. Uh, animals frozen and dead and try to revive and giving heat and, and warm clay. It never never worked of course. But but he was kind of setting the mood to to a path that was then taken by other scientists. And uh, maybe you remember or you know the story of Giovanni Aldini, which is actually uh, Galvani's nephew. And uh, and he takes on on Hunter's deed and uh, but it plays with electricity at a certain point he thinks right they said, Hunter wasn't wrong, it just missed one key component, it missed electricity. So okay, you can transfer some kind of life essence between one person and the other, or, or renew it in a person, uh, but you need to kind of ignite this essence, and so that's in the electricity part. Um, and then he, he starts and goes on a, on a long journey in Europe, where he tried to demonstrate that electricity could have many, many medical benefits. Um, among this is most remembered for a famous experiment, maybe demonstration, um, in London, 1802, and uh, he tried to, he wanted to try to revive resuscitate person. So he gets a body from uh, somebody who was uh, just executed that morning, and kept cold, and then he came to his room, to his table, he attached electrodes to his face, to his arm, then run this machine that he had built it, and his body start moving, arms start rising, and the eyebrows open, and, uh, and his torso starts bending and, and, and almost walking. That, they say, how do you know that? The next day, the time had a one-page long report on this event. In this event, there were members of the royal family, there were the top intellectual of London at the time. It was very, very intense. And that the, the, the intellectual <coughs> current that he was he, he started the kind of follow it's called was called what is called now galvanism. Anyhow, when he started to try to you know have his, the art of this person to beat again, it didn't work. Of course, so the person stayed there. But uh, <laughs> the, the the story I kind of think you're maybe familiar with the story. First of all, was from here from Bologna, but. Um, there was another person here that uh, had a father who was a dear friend of Aldini, and Aldini was often in her house. And uh, this young person was a child at the time, at five years old, more or less. And we go on to become one of the most important women in literature and history, because the story that I just told you is the story that Mary Shelley write and tell of the creature that Dr. Frankenstein built. And, uh, of course, then has been revised in many, many ways. <laughs> but uh, but there is something, as I said, that from here on we're kind of familiar to. It, it would be a dream. It would be a possibility to do that eventually. How do we? How do we exactly do it? Uh, so in this old story, if you if you ever read Frankenstein, you remember the creature uh, ends up at the North Pole, hates warm, hates heat, hates the fire. Uh, beginning actually is in the Alps, in the high mountain. Uh, he's stuck in this kind of middle life, middle gray life, in which there is, there is life without this difference. So, what's the role of the cold? What's the role of temperature in this story? Well, uh, temperature, and especially uh, low temperature for us, for humans, there's been an enemy for a long, oh, sorry, for a long, long time, um, which we've been killed by the thousands, by, by winters and by cold. It became a cure lately 
in the last century after the Second World War, and now we see whether it can become a hope. Uh, so why it was a killer? Why it was the enemy? Well, many people died died for for exposure to coal. Here, this is living capital who didn't really die in this part, but he, he, he pretend to die. Uh, but uh, no, the people in the sea, people at sea, are, are mostly mostly a danger to die by hypothermia and by freezing. Even if we all know that he could have climbed up here, <laughs> so, so, so there, was, there was some form of cinematographic pushing there to make us sad. But um, so yes, people at sea can uh, often die of, of cold exposure. Uh, people on the battlefield <coughs> die of cold exposure. Uh, many of those. Um, Second World War, there will be 250,000 people died from, from heat. Hannibal will lose uh, half of his soldier during the crossing of the Alps by, by cold exposure. But something happened in, in the Russian campaign by Napoleon. Napoleon was a great general. He had excellent medical um, logistics. He invented the ambulance, just to say one, for the camp hospital. Uh, first, like first surrender, uh, for uh, first responder were were, um, were invented here. Um, so what happened after the battle? After the battles, the doctors go on the field. They do something called triage, or meaning that they look at the people that were they're injured, and they decide if they can be healed. If they're too serious, the injury is too fatal, they'll be left for dead. And uh, French doctor realized two things. First, that people that look dead, they weren't very dead. So it may be some kind of mistake from time to time. And from here comes the sentence that we we'll be often use in medicine later on, that you're not dead until you're warm and dead. And uh, second is that they, they were taking the injured people, injured soldiers, to the camp where it took the back line, and the soldiers were going in the soldier torture, <coughs> and the officers were going in the officer torture. And what's the difference? Well, the soldiers were surviving, and officers were dying. And, and so they didn't understand why. The only difference between the two quarters was that the officer quarter was warm and the soldier quarter not because they were soldiers. Uh, so they start to think that coal may be useful. It not just be something that can kill us, maybe something that can save us. And uh, even are careful to redrawing the definition of death. So they say to the doctor, if you're going on the field, if the body you're, you're visiting is rotting, then it's dead, then that's sure. Uh, if the head is further down than 50 centimeters from the body, then also that, that is, is, is secure. But on the other case, the other case, just be careful. And, and this is the first book that came out from that campaign. Uh, Maurice Chaboupre wrote it. And uh, it's the first book that is pressed and describes how we can use temperature and cold for the good reason. Uh, there are even cases more, more fantastic and very more recent. This is Hannah Bangerholm. And uh, Dr. Colin, fellow doctor in, in Norway, uh, she fell into a, um, a frozen river while she was uh, cross country skiing, uh, head down, uh, feet up. Stay underwater for about an hour, heart stopped, uh, was, uh, needed an helicopter to come and help it. The place was not very, very easy to reach. Um, they didn't want to leave it there. First, was, she was very young. And second, she was one of their colleagues, so she knows. The doctor that I know, know anywhere. And uh, um, so she got a uh, helicopter down to, to an hospital, uh, attached to the heart lung machine, slowly, slowly reborn. After a few hours, her heart started beating again. Then she went back to normal temperature. She entered in a coma, uh, staying in a coma for a couple of weeks. Then woke up from the coma, uh, paralyzed because they called it pretty much lesion all their peripheral nerves. And then after months of physiotherapy and training, she now is a person, a perfectly normal person. So not consequence from this accident. She was dead and came back from the dead. And so there, but because she was cold. So there is something that we can all think of this. So you can't die if you're not alive. That's a, that's a subtle difference that we can, we can think. So where, where we can find out the sleeping nature? Because okay, that's where we start. Okay, we could do these are people that exceptionally survive <coughs> atrocious conditions. And there are many, many others. I'll just show you a few examples of those. Uh, in nature, hypersleep comes in the form of what we know as hibernation, which is not cryonic, as many confound the two terms. So there's no freezing of anything. Hibernation is just a prolonged period of inactivity due to low metabolism. 
something that animal like this do. Uh, like hamster, bears, and squirrels, and hats. You don't have any idea how many hamster are any every year throwing the garbage because their owner think they're dead, but they're actually <laughs> worth hiding. Uh, something we know for a long time is Lator Spallanzani. It's famous Italian physiologist. He 150 pages of his research diary are dedicated to hibernation. He was fascinated by hibernation. He realized that he could put a bat into a jar, pull the air out of the jar, and the bat would die. That's what we expect. But if the bat was hibernating, then he wouldn't die. It would stay there quite a long time before dying. So he tried to understand. This what was puzzling, but he couldn't figure it out. Uh, so what is truly hibernation? This is uh, Alp marmot from the Alps, um, an animal that, if you're uh, familiar with this environment, uh, it's kind of the rumors of the legend that all the marmots you know, disappear the same day in fall and then reappear on the same day in the spring. What were they doing in the middle? They are in between, they are hibernating. So what's truly hibernation? This is hibernation. This is the body temperature of the marmot, this black line here. We read it on this axis here, and that's about 37 here, right? Then it drops. It drops here to 10 degrees Celsius. The tinier line here, thinner line here, is uh, ambient temperature. So ambient temperature about 7.5, 8 degrees. 10 degrees is body temperature. So it's like a passive body. Uh, but hibernation is not this event. We're always thought about temperature, but it's not temperature. It's actually what happened here, where this uh, event happened, this is metabolic rate, and energy consumption drops about 95%. And therefore, after this, temperature uh, diminishes. So what does it mean? I mean the hibernation is something that animal can use to turn off their metabolism, turn off their energy expenditure, and therefore their cooling. It's not temperature producing their reduction in metabolism. That's happening before, and that is with other means. And temperature just follows. Which is very useful, very useful for us. Uh, we can also ask where it comes from, why there are animal can have to do that. And uh, it's easy to answer uh, the, all the species that, all the group of species and the genera that come before us, like the reptiles, they're not able to control their body temperature, they don't have the power. Um, they cannot produce a large amount of heat like we do uh, during their life. Um, so they have to rely on outside sources of heat, like the sun. So that's why you see a lizard in the morning warming up in the sun. Why do they have to warm up? Because their brain and their muscle, they work at the best performance when they are about 25, or maybe 30, more or less this temperature. And they cannot reach this temperature by themselves. Right? So they need to be activated by the environment. We did a trade with evolution. We decided that we want independence and freedom, so we want to be you know, independent from the sun. So we rise our metabolism. This is just actually a qualitative difference. That if this square was true, we go up to the roof right here. And, uh, but with the condition that we have to maintain our body temperature state. So about 37 plus, minus one for all the mammals. And this requires a tremendous amount of energy that we need to keep finding food and, and, and use it. And when we evolved, uh, we had to rely on this power to survive. Why? Because mammals appear on the planet about 200 million years ago, when dinosaurs were here. So how do you survive dinosaurs? Well, exactly using this power. You can use your power to live at night, when the dinosaurs are very less active. And when you go to sleep and to rest, then you can not just sleep, but go into hibernation. And this special kind of hibernation, the short-term hibernation, uh, we refer to the technical word of torpor. So you survive by using torpor as an austerity measure to save every drink of energy that you can and to expand it all during the night and try to survive. For 200 million years, we survive. For 150 now, 200 million to 65, 130 million years we we go this way, but then luckily evolution <laughs> as a favor for us. So we we were favored by evolution, by distinction of the dinosaurs. But if we look at it in a more scientific way on a plot of, of evolution of the mammals, we see how hibernating species are represented by a color drop here, which means 
the, the genetic background that allowed this state, the survival to this state, is actually common to our ancestors, and therefore is probably shared among every other mammal. Can humans and turtles that? Can we do it? Since other animals do it, can also we do it? Uh, many legends support this idea. This is uh, the, the Russian town of Skov, here in St. Petersburg. In 1900, this paper called Human Hibernation came out on the British Medical Journal. And saying what? Saying that this, in this town, during winter, very poor town, just farmers, um, people were you know, gathering together in the large building they had at the center of the village, but not to just pass winter together, just to help each other. They, he said they were sleeping the winter off. They were just going there, sleeping in the room, and then wake up in spring. There is no other report on this at the end. But and no one knows who wrote this. But <laughs> if, uh, if there is a, someone interested in history of medicine, that would be an interesting hunt to try to find this, the root of this story. I don't, I don't know much more about it. But um, there are other other uh, few that we can hibernate actually. So when we are a fetus before being born, we are actually hibernation. We have the same metabolism that we scale with other hibernators, and not regular mammals. Then when we are born, uh, newborn, then we would reach full mammal status. But before we are actually a torpid mammal. And there are patients. This is a patient that was seen in 2002 at the University of Bologna here complaining about the weird symptoms, like not being able to think, very, very tired, he couldn't wake up, which he de described pretty much the entire world population, but uh, on Monday morning. But uh, he was much more seriously affected by this condition. Anyhow, what happened? So according to this physiological parameter of this patient, every morning at 6 a.m., he drops his temperature down like the marmots will do, like the, the, like the hamster. It looks like a hamster. A <coughs> hamster. And, uh, and we don't know why that happened. This patient developed this after a flu, and then for a couple of years stayed like this, and then back to normal, apparently. Um, so something must have happened in his brain, something that had unlocked some old mechanism that was still present. And, uh, and so we know that it potentially is possible. Uh, so why do we do a new store for any other? Well, if you imagine to be one of these two models, you have to be smiling and be happy in photo shooting in the snow, which is not very comfortable, and your body will try to compensate for the cold that is around. So all your organs will activate the heart, run the postitious skin, um, and that's because your brain will tell those organs to do so. Uh, it's the brain that will command which temperature we are setting and uh, how much energy are we using. And this is in a small part of the brain. In the brainstem, an older region called the rapopagus, which acts as a switch. And when you turn it on, you like your metabolism skyrockets, and you get fever and using a lot of energy. And and, and no one has tried, at least no one knew what would happen if you stop it, if you prevent this cell from being active. It's a complicated network that controls this region in the um, in the brainstem. We could go into detail if anyone is interested, of course. Uh, but the final result is that, and I don't know how much you can see here, but that if you take an animal that doesn't go into torpor or hibernation normally in nature, and uh, you see a thermograph image here of this uh, rats, just an example, and then you, you use a drug um, that uh, kind of tricks those neurons in order to switch them off and not let them work. Uh, just those neurons here, not the rest of the body is fine, no drugs to the rest of the body, just there. Then you can have this. You don't see the rat anymore. I'll dry it for you. Uh, I'll draw this border. And, uh, and it's kind of the marmot. This temperature is 15. This temperature is about 17, I think. So same deal. And then you suspend it, and it goes back to its normal life, like nothing happened. So no words. Um, this was published in 2013, the Journal of Science. And from there, the research hibernation really took like a different pace because we wanted to try to do that. And I'd like to uh, go to the last part of my talk in supporting even more this case eh, about the story of two extraordinary cases that, that are very, very um, puzzling and, and can find an explanation, the only explanation in Torpo. If you're familiar with this picture, it means you have some interest in mountaineering and, and, and you like. Natural environment, this is the Everest, uh, and this is a line of tourists uh, ready to reach the top of the world. 
This is the healer step, final part, here is the top. And uh, of course, true mentoring is a very upset with this event, because they say people ruin the environment and ruin the Everest and, and bring a lot of garbage that stays there. But there is something more to worry. Because the Everest is still a 20% lethality rate. So if you go with your 10 best friends, with eight we come back. So pick, pick the, your friends with a car. It's a one time in a lifetime event option to have a natural event providing you with this. Um, and why do people die? Um, but beside the Sherpas, Sherpas here are, those are all bags of Everest. Sherpas are blue and they mostly die for a working accident or, or avalanche or, or falling down in a cranium. Um, but tourists, they die here in the last part, in the last thousand meter, and try to reach the top. And they die here because this part of the mountain is called the death zone. And it's not called the death zone because people die there. It's called the death zone because it makes you die. Um, above that altitude, there is so little oxygen that your cells will not divide anymore. So you can sit down here, stay on a couch, watch Netflix, and die in a few days. <laughs> if you wanted to die slowly, that's the best, that's way, the best way. You also be perfectly preserved because temperature is about minus 30, so uh, you'd be happy. But while we're, while we're watching the death zone here, uh, here you have three conditions, little oxygen, low temperature, and fasting. Uh, mountaineers that go up here, they don't eat anymore because the brain food center pretty much shut up. So those conditions are the same that nature can trigger the fancy food. <coughs> and, uh, and in 1997 and in 2005, those two people were trying to reach the top of the, of the Everest, uh, Ben Weathers and Lincoln Hall, and, and they died there, like many other travel. And uh, they were left for 36 and 48 hour, uh, at 83,000 meters and 86,000 meters. They were not just left, meaning they were abandoned. They were certified that. He had a cardiologist who was a friend of him with them. He visited them. He said he was dead. His wife received a call and said, hey, your husband, you know what? He died on the Everest. Sorry. <laughs> and and uh, the same story happened to him. He actually didn't even reach the top. He was, at least he was coming down. And so what happened 36 hours after this? Backwares walked back to the camp. It's not like he was found still alive. It's not like emergency survival, you know, um, help. He came back to conscious uh, on his own, on his own strength, and then walked back to the camp. He, the same thing, he was found at 86,000 meter on the morning by other mountaineers coming up to to go to the top of the Everest, and they found this weird person sitting on the lotus position on a crest on the Himalaya, looking at the dome coming up. And he turned towards those people and says, I think you will be, you'll be wondering what I'm doing here. And I say, yes, <laughs> I feel very wondering. And, uh, and they help and then going back and missing by the way their chance to reach the top of the Everest. Uh, and they all both wrote a book, they're planning a witnessing to say, you can just imagine their families and their, and their and the loved ones, they, they, were, they thought they were dead. Um, there is no <coughs> actual medical explanation for what happened, why they were able to go back to life, come back to life. The only explanation is that Torpor was kind of unlocked in this condition, and maybe the fact that so many people are now going on the Everest uh, will present us with the opportunity to have a, a larger genetic background variety in people there, and therefore maybe some special phenotype could evolve. Considering that not everyone, fortunately, gets into trouble and die. I mean, 80% of people survive, so we don't know whether they could survive. But is a further proof that we can do that. Um, who will develop this technology? Is a technology that is possible to develop? Well, uh, when you talk about hibernation and space travel, what the media usually buzz around, and uh, I've been talking with this for, uh, about this with, with The Guardian, The Washington Post, <coughs> any, any magazine in the world. But uh, the core is because uh, space agencies are interested. Uh, European Space Agency is funded, funded a group, a research group about a few years ago, that it is actually dedicated to find a way to induce torpor in humans. We call this uh, artificial torpor, we call it synthetic torpor. And, uh, NASA is starting, uh, started last year. There's a little 
uh, back in terms of development, but there's a lot more money, so you could reach us in pass of spirit <laughs> very fast if they want, if they want, maybe they don't want. Um, so why do we use Torpor for space flight? Uh, coming back to what we were saying at the beginning, well, this is the plan, our plan, this is Mars. Imagine going there, and you get three main problems. Well, there are many problems, but we just focus on three problems. To this potential trip, you get food problem, psychosis problem, and radiation problem. <laughs> and uh, let's start about food. So you get a small vessel here that was pretty much catapulted from the Earth to, the, to Mars. You get six people on it. Now we're talking about four people, but let's say six. Um, you need a lot of food because you're going to travel for nine months, best condition, optimum condition to Mars, one way, a little bit of Mars, then coming back to Mars, let's say two years, two years and a half. Plus, you're not really probably going to land on Mars. I'm not going to break your dream now because you just didn't say that, as I said. But um, if you land on Mars, because uh, Mars has the same gravity field as the planet of Earth, right? it's much the same size, a little less, then you need a, a rocket to, to, leave, to lift off. And there's no, uh, there no base there. You cannot launch a rocket from scratch. You have to build it. So at the moment, you can't land. If you land, you're going to stay there. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're probably going to we're gonna probably land on Phobos, which is a small satellite that, that orbits about, about uh, Mars. It's a 20, ki 20 kilometer rock. There's, there's nothing there. But <laughs> it's, it's a sun place where you can still take off. Uh, so uh, you, put, you get your food from, from the time. Um, and that's a problem in terms of money, because if you had to have that amount of food, which account to a few tons of food, uh, also you need a larger spacecraft to, to put the food on it, and that's going to cost you tons of money, because um, uh, shipping something in space is about 60,000 euro per kilogram, whether it's a kilogram of iron or a kilogram of feather, it doesn't change uh, the price, so it's still a lot of, a lot of cash. So you can, yeah, maybe you have a deeper pocket and, and you have the money, so let's go. Uh, then the second problem, you get people that freak out in space. Uh, if you try to test it on the planet, two every five pretty much go into what is called cabin fever, uh, psychotic attack, psychotic breakdown, and you attack your fellow um, voyagers, and, uh, and that's now geared when you're in the middle of an interplanetary trip, you know, no cops can reach you, and this mission is totally condemned. And you say, well, that's science fiction, I don't believe it. Well, last year, in a base in Antarctica, where those kind of tests are usually, are often done, because it's a very isolated place, very far. It's called Base Concordia. And, uh, well, one scientist stopped his fellow roommate because he was uh, spoiling him the, the end of the, of the trigger books he was reading. So, <laughs> and he got a little upset, <laughs> and so he stabbed him in the back. And uh, you can kill them, but uh, yeah, because we're only two people there a month, and that, that's what happens. That they can trigger. If you ever ever been on a on a sailing ship cruise with your families or friend for more than a few days, I'm sure you have dreamt of killing them in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what privacy lack in that was. We're not good. At that. So that's a big problem, and uh, and then there is a third problem, which is space radiation which is at the moment the main problem for space exploration. There is no solution to space radiation. Um, the, the planet, our planet is protected by the magnetic field of the Earth, which you now reflect the, the charged particle coming towards us, the plane of it, the tons of, of accelerated particles and protons. I uh, hear that we're gonna just get them all. And um, how do you shield spacecraft from radiation? Well, you can do an active shielding, so put an electromagnet here and generate a magnetic field that can deflect the particle. Such magnetic field, an electromagnet, uh, is going to be larger than this, this patient. It's not really at the moment something that we can do. Um, also, you can develop new material, something that can absorb those radiation. Those are super heavy material. We lift the weight of this spaceship with not being able to make a flight. It, also difficult, difficult to early. So, uh, bottom line, there is no solution, and as maybe you know, astronauts, they, their career is based on how much radiation they get. They have a dosimeter on them, and measure all the radiation they, they are exposed to. If they you know, raise over a certain threshold, they cannot fly anymore. Uh, if you go here, you raise over the threshold. 
someone said, no, come back, because you get twice the same person. Uh, and that is true for Mars, of course. But if you could put the, the crew into hibernation, then you don't need any more food, because you don't need this condition, or very little. Um, there is no risk of psychosis. And the mega plus bonus, super unexpected, is that um, hibernation provides an excellent protection, a biological protection, for what's radiation death. So, Cells that are irradiated when they are hibernated don't get damaged. There's very little damage, let's say, compared to what they are when they are uh, away. Plus, this will lead to a second degree of protection from radiation. Um, the, the perfect material to shield radi radiation from heating us would be water. And, but you cannot put you know, an a spaceship in, in a water balloon and then destroy it to Mars, and that would not work. So, but you can put an astronaut in a, in a bathtub, and the, therefore, I mean, hibernation protect them and plus water protect them. And that could allow for longer trip, <coughs> Mars for sure, but also maybe when we need to go to Europa, which is years of trips or travel behind the bus. So, uh, <laughs> that's kind of an overview of what is to go into space. And you can also ask us how much does it cost <coughs> very briefly. Uh, well, I brought you off few of the prices of major science research projects here, just for a comparison. These are scientific American data. This is the Human Genome Project, cost. And imagine this is the Human Brain Project, actually carried on by the European Commission. Let's try to simulate a human brain in an artificial in a medium like a, like a computer. Uh, not doing software. Anyway. Uh, this is the LHC, so Higgs boson particles. Uh, uh, universe and blah blah blah. Uh, this is the the making of Avatar. The making the, the net gross that Avatar grows at, at the box office. So Avatar make that money. Okay, okay. you could you could fund your own personal private LHC if you want. And uh, this is the annual alcohol use in the United States. So I wanted to put Veneto here, but it would cover the couldn't fit. Um, and this is the cost of imagining to fill the sphere of the F-35 hyperjet cost, which could also see, let's say, this is also kind of sick, development in science amount. Um, but just to say that uh, uh, money for science, they're, they're always there. And when they tell you there's no money for science, that's not true. It's just we don't want to put in a science different. There are plenty of places where we can get money, and for, especially for a state. And especially for a state that want to organize the research in order to still be kind of able to, to keep up with the new development technology. And I'd like to summarize some of these difficulties Italian research has at the moment in, in a short means that I'd like to show you, and I hope you like it. Uh, because we are scientists, scientists pushing, see, the car of knowledge. We work very hard to push the knowledge. And then we have our bureaucracy and our bureaucrats. They also tried to help us very much. They wanted to help us. They pushed very hard on themselves, but they are on the care. So, so it, it's not really helping very much. So this, we, can, we can sympathize very well. Not, not effectively. Our politicians are just launching us then. Not again aware of what they have in our problem. Uh, so I just you know, took you very fast on an equal eye view of what I uh, call the national research here. Uh, I actually <coughs> happen to have a book out on this topic, which just came out for you now. This so more and more um, stories are shared there. Uh, stories like what happened, how animals can survive actual freezing, or what happened to people that get cryonic in, in this kind of institute. What happened to Lazarus? How did he come back to life? Is there something related to torpor? Whether you can swim after having eaten? That's that's the basic yeah. question that we all have in summer. Can I can I swim? How how far did you eat a long time ago? Um, what happened to cold in our mood? Uh, how could affect depression? And what does the latest research? It was a paper, actually a news coming out really a few days ago, on this this very experiment and try to. Uh, exchange blood with cold fluid and to be able to bring gunshot people that had gunshot wound in the hospital from, from the street to gain a couple of farmers. Apparently, apparently was successful. Uh, the story of Simon Taylor Cambridge, who also was a friend of Aldini and Mary Shelley, and he also speak about end life. Um, how Arctic fish um, help in uh, identify non-colligative anti-frozen protein that uh, can actually maintain 
liquid status in the animal temperature, what is cryotherapy? And, and how this weird animal, the pygmy opossum, which hibernates for a few years, help a group of um, creationists in Australia to solve the problem in their mind on how Noah was able to fit all the animals in the ark. They had this <laughs> true problem, and they were working out to And they thought that it was a miracle, and the sleep, uh, God was uh, you know, imposing a, a magic sleep, a miracle sleep of the animal. The animal didn't eat each other, uh, and they stayed there. Why? Um, they didn't like this solution because uh, there is something called uh, the economy of miracle. So uh, apparently you cannot uh, appeal to a miracle unless it's strictly necessary. There is, there is another way you can you have to take that away. Uh, so they, was, they were puzzled and last year this friend showed that this uh, pygmy opossum can actually stay a few years in hibernation, longest hibernation. They say, well, that's it. That's, it. That, that's the solution. Every, any animal where they were doing like, like him. And, and they were going to hibernation. They're very happy with the hibernation solution. So, or even creationists can use science to solve their problems, which is, which is fine. And uh, I also, as I, have, I like to prove the science solution, I have a, blog, a podcast that I like sometimes to, to keep up every few months for the laboratory defense here. You can log it in. And there is a new episode just yesterday. And uh, I want to terminate my talk with this actually sky view that I came from it, was with us for, for the entire talk. It's not a sky view from, from our planet, it's actually a sky view from Mars that I really hope that someone can one day see and you can spot here our planet and nearby our tiny, tiny moon. That said, I'd like really to thank you. I'm sorry if maybe I was a little extra in my... is Professor Ricardo Manzotti. Um, he has a quite peculiar background because he graduated in electronic engineering and then he went on with a PhD in robotics. But then I, I don't know what happened and <laughs> he, he graduated again in philosophy and he started being a researcher in philosophy. And he's now a professor at the uh, International University of Languages and Media in Milan. So uh, please welcome Professor Ricardo Manzotti. Thank you very much. Yes, the, yeah, I started, my background is in engineering and robotics. Then I got better and I became, I healed and I became something else. No, just a joke. But um, actually, uh, even when I was uh, working in AI, I'm still working in AI, my, the main topic of my research was something that might be interesting today to talk about, very important topic, which is the mind which is conscious, which is our experience. With the, in other words, 
What is the difference between an object and a subject? What is the difference between ourselves and, uh, let's say, uh, an inanimate object or a, a computer or whatever? It's a, it's a very old question, of course, but uh, just yesterday I was reading one of the last books by Harari, who are very famous, and I, I never had time to read them properly, which is very bad because I've been uh, talking about them a lot, assuming to know everything was in those books. And yesterday I had the time to read, to go through all the 400 pages of Homo Deus, and I was surprised to find out that almost 60% of those pages, by a rough estimate, were about consciousness. Were about the difference between consciousness and uh, uh, the rest of the world. So, in a way, an historian like Harari, a futurist like Harari, understood that the crucial, one of the key questions about our society, about our survival, is how to draw a distinction between subjects and objects. I use the word subject rather than the word uh, human beings or person or uh, whatever you want to use. Because I take this word from uh, a long-established tradition, philosophical tradition. So namely, we assume that the subject must have some features, some properties that are not shared by objects. But of course, this is quite uh, a problem. This is quite a problem, because we don't know basically anything about how to produce a subject out of objects. We have always assumed that there was a difference between subjects and objects. But how can we step between these two different domains? How can we get a subject out of objects? Which is basically the question behind the hard problem of consciousness. Which is basically the question behind AI. Will we ever be able to produce a conscious, let's say, an artificial subject? Because already talking about consciousness is already using a word that is very loaded with a lot of uh, philosophical connotation. So I will use that word with a lot of attention. So the question here is, what is the difference between subject and object? What is the difference between ourselves and the rest of the world? If there is any, because actually it may um, turn out that there isn't any fundamental difference. That after all, we are just uh, maybe a very complex biological machine, but nothing more than a biological machine. And first of all, we have to wonder, we have to ask ourselves, what does it make? It? Why do we think there's a problem here? Why do we think that there is something that the objects don't have? Now, in the past, there have been basically two main reasons why we draw a distinction between subject and object. The first distinction is uh, free will, or having goals. I won't talk about that. But I do agree, that's one of the main problems. The other problem is uh, having sensations, feelings. <coughs> we feel what happens to us. We have sensation. Object, don't. So I can split apart a car, and apart from the damage that they do to the car, nobody cares about the car. We care about the owner of the car. And I can split apart a robot, I can split apart a, a, a machine, I can split apart a tree, in a way. But we don't think the tree feels anything. I know there are people that claim the trees speak with people, but that's a questionable claim. Not everybody would agree about that. But in the assumption that uh, vegetables, trees, plants, objects, and uh, artifacts don't feel, we ask ourselves, when and why all of a sudden a physical system begin, begins to feel something? And what does it mean to feel something? Now, in the past, in the recent past, uh, we know that uh, there was a moment in which people started to disagree with the traditional notion that subjects were different from objects because subject has some kind of soul. In science, we set aside the notion of the soul, and they think with good reason, because soul is invisible, is immaterial, 
It cannot be the subject of an experiment. Can we observe a soul? Have you ever seen a soul? No. So, there are good reasons to set the souls aside from the scientific domain. But, once we throw the notion of the soul away, we were stuck with the only available option, the body. We said, if you are not souls, what else could we be in the physical world? Bodies. We are bodies. This is not real body, actually, it's made of wax. It's from, uh, they were very popular between uh, 18th century and 19th century. And apparently not only for scientific reasons. But people were very fond of, I, I mean, once they gave up the notion of the material mind, either because you were Cartesian or because you believe in the soul, today I will be very down to earth here. I will not get into any philosophical uh, uh, complex definition. But of course, if you like ask any question or ask me to be more precise about some of my claims, please do after. So, just um, <clears throat> give or take, there was a moment in which people said, okay, we are not going to believe any longer into the Cartesian mind, and we know that all cognitive uh, uh, science books or neuroscientific books about consciousness in the last 50 years, basically they start with a few pages against René Descartes. That seems to be something... Um, mandatory or compulsory that we need to say we are not dualists, oh my god. <laughs> but then, the, and, and of course they, they gave, uh, the, the, they, they sent the notion of the soul away too. I mean, the soul is even more problematic than the Cartesian man. But then, we are left with the body. And if we peer inside the body, we don't find anything like our experience. And uh, as Harari noted, but also other people like uh, Christoph Koch, like Giulio Tononi, like famous neuroscientists, the more we know about, well, let's leave Tononi aside for a moment, but all the other ones is true, the more we know about the brain, uh, the more difficult it seems that the brain is going to produce anything like our conscious experience. So, if you look inside the brain today with the super incredibly detailed images, we see a lot of stuff, we learn a lot of stuff about what the brain does, and if there is one thing that we don't find, is our experience. Let me call it conscience. We don't find anything like our experience, like our conscious experience inside the brain. So, that has been a little bit anticlimactic. So people started to consider other options. We being the brain, there isn't literally our experience. That was naive to think that our experience should be hidden in our brain. Maybe in our brain there is something else. There are images. But we haven't found any screen in the brain either. We haven't found anything like an image in the brain either. And I may argue that we have never seen an image in our life. Well, you may be surprised, but such a claim. I will make a series of very strong claims today. The first claim is that we have never seen an image. How could you say anything like that? Images are the kind of thing that exist only to be seen. No, I claim we see flat objects. We see pictures, paintings, canvas, frescoes, screens, retina displays on our screen, but those are flat objects. They're not images. The notion of image has been introduced in the 16th century, in 15th century, as a, a offshoot, as an offshoot of a theory of perception. Basically, when people started to introduce the notion of uh, perceiving the world through optical rays, they had the problem, something must go from the external object to our experience. How do we call this entity that goes from the external object to our mind? An image. But the problem is that there isn't such a thing as an image around today. Have you ever taken a picture of an image? No. You took pictures of paintings, pictures, not images. The image is that very thing that we see, but it cannot be an object, because if it were an object, it would require another image to be seen. So the notion of image is a self-contradictory notion. And so people haven't found anything like uh, images in the brain. That has been a little bit the uh, reason of uh, concern. 
So people shifted to something more abstract. Information. Information seems very, very nice. Because information is uh, a little bit like the soul. It's invisible. Have you ever seen a bit? No. Have you ever seen uh, information as information? No. You saw screens um, driven by uh, circuits. But have you ever seen information? Have you ever seen, let's say, the cover of Time magazine? Finally, after the Higgs boson, we've been able to take a picture of a bit. No. You've never seen it. And by the way, can you measure information? I mean, can you measure information as you can measure weight, mass, charge, physical stuff? Do you have an information detector? Have you ever seen a machine that you can put over another device and measure the amount of information inside that machine? No. You have, you can <coughs> compute the amount of information inside the machine given a series of hypotheses about the way in which that machine is going to be used. So, for example, if I take my pen drive, given a series, a, a set of assumptions about the fact that that pen drive may be used with another computer in a given uh, operating system, with a device able to read a certain amount of uh, capacities in those uh, machines, I can compute, not measure, I can compute, I can make a, a reasonable hypothesis about the number of yes and no questions that I can transmit using that device. Let me just make you a quick example about that. In, when I was a, a young student like you, in the 80s, um, we had uh, floppy disks. A very unreliable uh, mass uh, 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 data unit. We had floppy disks. <coughs> floppy disks uh, were able to contain each floppy disk at first, uh, the single density floppy disk, uh, 720 kilobytes of memory. Each floppy disk, a little bit more than half a megabyte. Overnight, somewhere in the Philips uh, department in the computer, they've been able to uh, sell, to, to design and implement floppy disk reader that were able to read and write the double amount of data on the same uh, kind of uh, support on the same kind of uh, disk and uh, for a while in order to sell new disk they invented that there were two different kind of disks to the point that the reader were not able to read the previous reader not because the disk inside was different but because they introduced a hole in the plastic uh, in the plastic um, uh, yeah case but the inside, the device, was exactly the same. So the point is that the same device may contain a different amount of information relative to the reader that is going to use the same device. So there's no way in which we can measure the amount of information like we can measure the amount of, say, electricity in a body or the weight of a body. There's no way to measure that point. So information is strange. Because it's invisible, is in principle eternal, because we can continue to copy the same program from one machine to the another machine. It can go from one body to another body. And so it reminds us very much of the thing that we started from, namely the soul. And in fact, today, a lot of people in San Jose, in California, and the like, Elon Musk and other people, they're considering whether it is possible to achieve immortality by uploading our mind from the brain to what? To the cloud. And the cloud very much is a metaphor. It reminds me of the heaven. Nobody knows where it is, and it suggests that it is upward, which is always something good. So, but the problem is, are we made of information? So you see, there's a hidden hypothesis there, namely that we are made of information. And if you think about that, shifting from we are made of an immaterial mind to we are made of information, it seems as to me a translation of the same metaphor. So we don't like to be made of matter. Why? Matter decay. So we don't like to decay. So
So it's better to be made of something that doesn't seem to be prone to decay and death. And information sounds good. So we saw this idea, maybe, have you seen Black Mirror, the, the episode San Junipero? Mm -hmm. Very nice. Immortality, you achieve immortality, but they didn't, that, well, they show it, but they didn't emphasize too much at the end that the server that keep the show running are consuming an incredible amount of energy in those places at the very end of the episode. And uh, so, and I believe that information might be a misleading metaphor too, for another reason. The notion of information started to be uh, popular in, in, uh, between uh, the end of uh, 19th century and the beginning of 20th century, uh, moving from uh, human beings. You know that computers at first were not machines. They were real human beings. They were real human beings who were doing computation for the uh, British Empire. They needed a lot of computational power, and they needed a lot of people doing computation to keep all their bank accounts in order. And so they had this uh, figure, the computer, that was a human being at first. But the computer was uh, not only a human being, but it was also someone who was doing the thing that for ages had been taken to be the, the best metaphor for thinking, namely computing, doing calculus. Think about Leibniz and all the way back up to Plato. What is the metaphor for thinking? Mathematics, logic. So they took a metaphor from human being in order to talk about a machine, the computer, with Turing, Shannon, and the like. And Shannon, at the very first of it, uh, the introduction to the theory of communication, in the introduction to the theory of communication in 1949, warns us against taking this metaphor too seriously. Because that would be a um, circular loop. So we took a metaphor from human, from thinking. What is thinking? Thinking is doing computation. Then we take that metaphor, computation, as the paradigm for thinking. And we put it into a machine. Then what we do? We take that metaphor from computers as a metaphor for our thinking. So we close the loop. We started from an idea about what is thinking, computation, numbers, platonic ideas. Then we build a machine that some, some kind of uh, embodiment of that metaphor. And then we bring back that metaphor to explain what our brain does. What our brain does? Computes. It runs software. It's a computing machine. It's not a computing machine. It's a, a biological machine that makes us move around. If we had a computer doing the same stuff, we would need a computer doing computation. But so far, this assumption that in our brain we do uh, computation is just a metaphor. Of course, we can always say that everything can be, can be modeled by a simulation, which is based on numbers. But that would be like saying that when I throw a ball, and the ball draws a trajectory in, in, in the air, the ball is computing its trajectory. It's solving the mathematical equation of dynamics. It's not solving any mathematical equation. I would be solving those mathematical equations if I had to, to write a program that uh, simulates the movement of the ball. But the ball doesn't do anything like that. Likewise, from the fact that we have deep learning, that we have machines that are able to mimic our behavior by doing computation, doesn't follow that in our brain there are computation. Doesn't follow that there are computation in the world either. So, I know that all of that may sound a little bit radical, like my claim that there are no images, even if we are surrounded by all kinds of images. But my point is all this metaphor, uh, led us into looking inside our brain. Because, as I said at the beginning, we had two very strong insights about what we could be. The first insight was, we must be a body. Why? Because we throw away the notion of the soul and the material mind, which I do agree. That was a good step. But maybe just rushing for the body was a little bit rushed. Maybe, I mean, 
we are not literally inside our body. But the main reason why people kept looking inside the body was that there seemed to be no scientific alternative. If you're not an immaterial mind, we have to be inside the body. We're likely inside the brain. And then people started to look inside the brain to find something like information or computing processes or something like that. Which in a way defeated the original idea, which was to find the physical counterpart of what we are. And uh, we've been looking inside the brain, as I said, for the last 40, 50 years, but we haven't found anything convincing. This is another wax head anything convincingly like our experience. And let me get back once again about it. Well, no, I will skip that. Maybe I will get back if you want to know more about it. So, because time is running short. So, is it possible to make an alternative? Like, is it possible, like, in, this is a fake, of course. This, I mean, this has been presented as a medieval uh, engravings. It wasn't, of course. It was done in 1880-something uh, by... Flammarion, but it was presented as but it is a very famous image and it represents the idea that sometimes we need to look beyond our assumption. We need to take into consideration preposterous hypotheses. We need to take into consideration preposterous ideas. Why? Because the current ideas have not been able to produce any particularly convincing result. That maybe in the future they will, but so far, so far, I think it is a fact that nothing we have found either in, sorry, both in neuroscience and in, um, um, let's say, computational uh, cognitive sciences requires anything like our conscious experience. This is not to say that we'll never be able to find anything like that. I'm just saying that if you go through hundreds and hundreds of pages of empirical evidence, empirical findings from neuroscience, you find a lot about moving, how the brain moves our body, you, you find a lot about how the, the brain takes the signals in order to, for example, react to a phase, react to a given situation, you find a lot about how to cheat the marketing people and convince them that if you look a lot about the subject, about the given subject, you're going to buy their product or something like that. So there's a lot of empirical data, but all that empirical data may happily continue to exist without nobody ever being conscious of what's going on. The fact that we have an experience of the world is completely unexpected from the actual available uh, empirical evidence. Only if we add to the empirical data from neuroscience that we have conscious experience, we understand, we, we, we have the problem. But we, if we don't add to the available empirical evidence that first person report the fact that we say that we experience the world, we have no reason to suppose that we experience the world. It's not something that we measure. It's not something that people found in a lab. It's not something that we had animals and all of a sudden in a lab they say, oh my god, these animals feel something when we trigger their brain, when we trigger their body. No, it's something that we know. It's something that we experience. And let me put it bluntly. What is the problem of experience? Why is it such a problem? Because when we experience the world, we experience something that is different from our body. So right now, I'm not having an experience of the neural cells in my frontal lobe or in my occipital cortex. I don't see my occipital cortex. I see you. I see your shirt. I see the color of your clothes. I see the walls, I see the tree behind the, 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 the window. Why is that possible? When you have a computer, when you have a, a, a phone recognizing you very reliably, so reliably that it is uh, at the, you know, um, the core of the face ID mechanism. So it's so reliable that I give my phone to my friend that I don't expect they to be able to 
hope to unlock my phone just by looking at it. So it's super reliable. Still, do you think that the phone sees you? No. The phone, nobody thinks that the phone see, sees us. Nobody thinks that the camera, that camera is seeing me. Yet, in that camera, there's taking place a lot of stuff that is shared by my uh, body. There's an eye, there's a, a sensor, there are many signals. A lot of stuff taking place there is taking place also in my, in my body. Still, nobody thinks that the camera sees me. I see you. So, I have an experience of properties that are not contained inside my body. People have been looking inside brains, as I said at first, for, for, for ages, and they haven't found anything like those properties. So, what might have been the, the logical conclusion? Well, let's look elsewhere. No, that was not the conclusion. The conclusion was, the experience must be in the brain. Why? Because the brain is material. And they do agree with that. As we will see, I don't deny that point. But, but what about the fact that we don't find anything like our experience in the brain? Well, solution. Experience is phenomenal. What does this uh, technical term, not in the everyday usage of the language, but in, in philosophy of mind, what does phenomenal mean? Phenomenal means something that appears only to the subject who has an experience of that entity. So, I have my phenomenal experience, but you can see it if you, open, if you crack open my brain. You have your own phenomenal experience, but nobody else can see it. <laughs> now, to me, this sounds a little bit crazy. If, in science, if I go to a physics laboratory and they say, listen, we have a new kind of particle, only, only I can see it. It's why? Because it's phenomenal. You look at me and say, listen, Ricardo, this doesn't work. I mean, in, in the natural world, the physical world has to be made of stuff that everyone can measure, observe. It might be difficult, it might take a lot of money, but in principle, we must be able to see it, all of us. Now, in neuroscience, we made the virtue of, in my understanding, a very misplaced notion. We said, that is the mystery of consciousness. The mystery of consciousness that is something that nobody can see. It's phenomenal. Well, to me, that sounds very much uh, like an unconvincing um, hypothesis. So, let's try to look elsewhere. What is important? Cinque minuti, perfect. <laughs> Good. So, very quickly, very quickly. In the traditional approach, people have been looking in the brain. So, a very popular notion was mind, brain, identity theory. Alas, it failed miserably. So, people have been looking for something phenomenal. But now, today, I would like to propose to look elsewhere. That's why the title of my presentation is A Not Anthropomorphic Theory of the Mind. So let's assume for a moment, let's not be anthropocentric. Let's not think that we are where our body is. And let's consider a apparently preposterous hypothesis. Namely, when we have an experience of this apple, like we all, all of you have right now. Right now, you're looking at this apple. What do you find in your own experience? Something red, round, shining, and epish. Right? Very good. Is there anything in your brain right now that is red, bright, round, shining, and happy? I, I guess the reason. But there is something in this room that is red, round, shining, and happy. Yes, the apple that I hold in my hand. So, the hypothesis that I put forward, and I know that it is extremely <coughs> counterintuitive, is that we are not made of stuff taking place inside our body. We're made of stuff that is taking place outside our bodies. Namely, the stuff that we find in our own experience. I always say, if we look inward, we find we get outward, we get outside. If we look inside ourselves, we, we find the external world. If I ask you, what are you thinking about right now? You may say, well, I'm thinking about my car, about my, my, where I left my, my visa and taking a fee. 
I'm thinking about my home, I'm thinking about the shops, I'm thinking about the restaurant, I'm thinking about my holidays. And then I would say, no, 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 I don't want you to talk to me about things that are outside of you. I want you to talk to me about things that are inside you. And then he would say, well, then I can talk to you about my thoughts about my neighbor, I'm talking to you about my feelings about uh, Juliet, uh, I'm, I'm talking like Roman Juliet, that's right. There's no real Juliet here. <laughs> <laughs> talking to you, it's not a biographical uh, comment. And, and I would say, well, that's still things that are taking place outside of you. You're, not, you're never talking about, unless you have eaten too much, you're never talking about what's going on inside you. And definitely, even if you're talking about something that's going on inside your body, you're never talking about something that is going inside your brain. Unless you've just been to a doctor and they gave you very bad news using devices, but because of your own experience, you never have any experience of anything taking place inside your brain. So, the not anthropomorphic and definitely not anthropocentric, whereby anthropocentric, I mean body-centric hypothesis that I'm putting forward is that our experience, ourselves, what we are, is not a piece of the body, but it is a piece of the world. So, in, 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 um, in uh, very, ju just with a catchphrase, <laughs> my point is that we are not a body, we are a world that is taking place because of the body. So, the idea is that we are not mental apples, but we are physical apples. We are not neural apples. We are things that are taking place in the external world. Now, I would have liked to say more, but I will let you... A lot of things to say, but I will just say a couple of things very quickly, and I, I hope I'll stay in five minutes. And then. So, very quickly, I know there are two objections that you can make to me immediately. So, let me anticipate that. The first objection is, but what about subjectivity? We all see the apple in a different way. Well, don't we have in physics, as of Galileo's time, uh, relative velocity? Relative velocity is something that is different for every object that interacts with another object. That didn't lead to the collapse of uh, the edifice of physics. On the contrary, it allowed us to get a better understanding of the notion of velocity as something that is intrinsically relative. So the idea here is that this apple may actually be different for each of us, not because we have a subjective experience, but because the apple is taking place in a different way for each of us. So I will quickly get to the final point. And so, this is what I call the space-temporal, space-time chessboard. Namely, the idea that everything that is physical has to take place in space and time. Traditionally, we had, so here we have time and there we have space. And if something is physical, it has to be there. And in my understanding, it has to be observable by everyone, not just phenomena. Tradition wanted to look for our experience in the body, in the brain. This is very anthropocentric, to my understanding. We want to have a special place in nature. We want to require special principles to explain our incredible, wondrous, um, phenomenal experience. But that is suggesting something completely different. The reason why we believe that consciousness is a problem it's not because consciousness is a problem, but only because we've been looking for consciousness stubbornly in the wrong place. And of course, here, there was nothing like the apple. There was an apple when we see an apple. Yes, there was. <clears throat> Where? In a different place in space and time. Is that a problem? No. We just have two objects, and we have just to choose the one that is closer, that is the closest to our own experience namely the apple rather than the brain. 
So, the apple is the symbol of the external world, of course. So, uh, Freud said that there had been a sort of blown to our narcissism. One was to, when we lost our position in the, the, the center of the world. The other one was when we lost uh, our position in the biological kingdom. I think that we have to lose our position in the ontological domain. We are not special. Subjects are not spatial. Subjects are just, uh, and this is the anthropocentric view that I try to get rid of, subjects are just um, a part of the world. In particular, they are that part of the world that takes place because of our bodies. Why do we perceive a certain part of the world? Because that's the world that takes place because our body is with all its machinery, so I'm not uh, dismissing the importance of the brain, but because our body is in a given place. And it's not by chance, so that's why I put here as a metaphor at the center of the world an apple or objects. You see, rather than putting the body at the center of the universe, and surrounding the body, like in the Vitruvian Man with the, by Leonardo, all of the universe, I, in this picture, I put in the center of the world, what? The world itself, made of objects. And I put, metaphorically speaking, all the bodies all around, because there are those objects, because the body is nothing more than another object, that are responsible for the existence, for the taking place of the world in a certain way. That way is the external world that is one and the same, according to this hypothesis, with my own experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mazzotti. Uh, yes, we have a question. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, earlier you, you said something about the Pumoni. You said that the more we uh, study the brain, the less we understand about the let's leave Pumoni uh, yes. aside. <laughs> um, Tononi basically crafted a theory that says that consciousness is something that can be measured uh, physically. Uh, it's a physical property, like uh, you mentioned. Uh, Temperature or, or weight. Uh, right. uh, do you find it questionable? Yeah. Well, first of all, that's, uh, that's not true. Let me say why. I made the example that we can measure the weight of an apple with the physical device. In the case of Tononi, he never suggested a physical device, an instrument, an informameter, an integrated informameter. But he has created models. He wrote equations. Yeah. He wrote equations. And he made several hypotheses. In fact, Tononi is honest enough to say that he's moving from axioms. So, all he is a house of cards, theoretical house of cards, is based on those axioms. Now, axioms are not the kind of things that I discover empirically. They're the kind of things that I uh, postulate. And then I have to verify. It. And another problem with Tononi is theory is that he never explained how can we shift, how can we transform integrated information into experience. So even if it were true, and it might be that integrated information is a very good parameter to measure what's going on in the brain, and there are, I mean, Marcello Massimini, for example, in, in, in Milan is doing very interesting experiments about how to use this uh, parameter, this index, in order to make prediction about the, 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 the health of a brain. Even if we have that uh, as a nice parameter, there, there is no uh, explanation in any of Tononi's work about how integrated information becomes experience. So why should, say, a state with integrated information of, say, 1,000 be like my experience of red, rather than be like my experience of green? Maybe we will never reach an explanation. It's a mystery. But why has to be a mystery if you are surrounded by objects just like our experience of them? There's only one thing that prevents us from taking those objects seriously. That we move from the assumption that we must be inside our body. Once we set that hypothesis aside, that prejudice aside, there's no reason... I mean, 
Imagine that the scientists found that whenever we look at the brain, we found that inside the brain there is a, a field with the color and the shape of an apple. Would they not have said that that field is our experience of the apple? Of course they would. That's what they've been looking for. If you look at the experiment of Tuttle of, uh, in the 60s, in the 40s, and so forth, that, that, that was looking for, even if they didn't say it explicitly. But they haven't found anything like that. So if it is possible, I think that in science, if it is possible to get rid of a mystery, it's good. I like it. I like the floor. I leave the floor. <laughs> Okay, so thank you for the question, and our next guest is Professor Pascal Van Entenbrink. He's a professor at the Georgia <coughs> Institute of Technology in the USA, and that does need a lot of presentation because it's one of the best universities in the world for uh, technological subjects. And he also earned two honorary <laughs> doctoral degrees from the universities of Louvain and Nantes, and he is mainly known as a researcher and professor for his work on uh, constraint programming, which is basically a nicely done mixture, let's say, uh, of optimization theory and uh, AI and learning techniques, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so please welcome Professor Pascal Van Entry. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, today uh, so the so this so the the normal attention of a human being is about 45 minutes so uh, so you're about an hour and uh, 30 minutes here so you're probably in hibernation <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm going to talk about is how we can emulate the brain so I think the people who actually have uh, been talking with, uh, with put the program together have been really very you know very smart because they put the right two toes before me um, so I'm going to talk about AI and the human experience. I know a little bit about AI. I know nothing about human experience except mine. So uh, the first part of the talk is going to be reasonably precise, and I'm going to speculate for everything else. Uh, so this is a quote that I want to start with. So every every technology which is sufficiently powerful is indistinguishable from magic. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with magic tricks, and I'm going to do I'm going to show you what computers can do. And then I will basically leave the magic and then talk about uh, some of the things that the magic is going to do in the next couple of, the next, let's say, five to ten years, and then beyond. Um, so in the, last, in the last five years, computers have been on the best players in Go. If you don't know what Go is, it's the most difficult strategic game. We were not expecting to be able to solve Go for another 20 to 30 years. It's an amazing achievement. People, you know, computers are these days beating, you know, uh, poker, the best poker players in the world as well. So this is once again something which was not expected because this is not only a strategic game, it's also a probabilistic game. So it's very, very difficult even for even for humans. I don't know if you know this. This is the same thing as uh, who, who, you know, who wants to be a big millionaire and so on. So this is a show where the computers are answering. Well, normally human beings are answering questions in a variety of domains. And IBM Watson is actually, you know, beaten once again the best player in the world in that particular game. I was not expecting that at all, and I'll tell you how the computer is doing it later on. Uh, this is amazing, right? So, so what you see on the screen is actually a set of digits. And if child of you know four years old or less or five or whatever it depends uh, can actually read these digits and recognize them. For uh, until about ten years ago or twenty years ago. Computers could not do that. This was beyond the capability of any computers. And at this point, uh, computers can classify images like this better than human. Okay. And so this is this has been a so the, the head of research in Google about ten years ago was saying computer vision is not making any progress. At this point, we can essentially say that computer vision is a solved feat. So human, humans, you know, uh, you know, computers can now, now classify these images. Uh, since about you know five or four or five years four, five, four or five years ago, uh, can actually classify this image with a performance which outperforms humans in, in the in, in the world. Uh, I was in China uh, last month visiting for about uh, for about a week. You can go in commercial district in China. The only thing that you show is your face. You don't have to show anything else. Uh, so once again, you know this is technology being used, uh, AI technology. This can be done in real time. So autonomous cars. People believe that they can actually drive autonomous, you know, every autonomous cars. No, because they can recognize these images in real time. Um, so what is an image, right? 
<laughs> so, you know, I'll tell you what I want to image this later on. Uh, speed recognition, and that's for language processing. Most of you have an iPhone, you, you, you may have played with Siri, or you have Alexia at home. So that's another breakthrough of AI technology. You can actually have uh, recognized, you know, that's, you know, recognized speech, recognized natural language processing. Uh, much, much better than, again, 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, you know, almost close to human performance, not quite yet. Uh, so many companies now actually have chatbot, I'll talk about that later on. Uh, Google Translate is much, much better than it used to be. Uh, this is how you can actually use some of these things. So what you see there is a sentiment analysis, trying to find out what people feel based on the tweets that they are sending. This is about a couple of million tweets that we analyzed uh, with Hurricane Irene. That's a hurricane that hit the United States about uh, six years ago. And yellow means good mood, uh, uh, red means, you know, uh, worried. And what you see there is that uh, the, 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 the tweets of people can actually locate the hurricane in a very precise fashion. Actually, we actually use something like that to predict the damages that a particular region gets. And this is the, the first and the, probably the last time that the Washington Post has actually talked about my work. So you have to work on social media to actually get you know, talked about it uh, in the 90s paper. Now, those, all, all of this have actually captured the imagination of the public. A lot of people talk about AI because of these things. This is a remarkable achievement. Some people also fear, you know, what AI can do and robots are coming. And when people, you know, have these fears, they see robots like this that are going to overtake humanity and destroy every, everybody. Uh, uh, so we are not really close to anything like this. But I want to show you one of the things that the robots are actually doing these days. So, so this is a, hopefully that's close. Yeah. So this is a robot uh, that is actually, I'm, I'm going to let this thing speak, but... Uh, <laughs> this is no advertisement. There are many of these, right? So this is just one. Mary, Megan sent a new photo. Would you like to look at it? Yes, please. Oh, here's a gem. Would you like to respond to Megan's post? Sure. Recording in three, two, one. So one of the main issues in the United States is just like that a lot of old people have nobody to see it, finally are spread out. And this robot I think is a way to actually uh, removing the loneliness of many old people in the United States. So what is AI? So I'm going to talk about AI now. And uh, so there are three, four things that happened in the last 10 years. The first one is that people are now saying that and this is the first thing that we have. We have a lot of data. People are saying that data is electricity. I think a better analogy would be saying that data is coal, the new coal, but coal is kind of negative, right? So data is the electricity. We have massive amount of data that we can learn from. The second thing that we have is very, very sophisticated computing power, uh, much more than we used to. And this is mainly coming the machine learning things because of GPU. And GPU, the, you know where that comes from, the way that was invented, that was invented from video games. So all these years that my son played video games have been actually useful for something. Um, and so the next thing is deep learning, and I'm going to talk about deep, deep learning in a moment. And then I think the last thing which is very important is that AI has been completely democratized. Machine learning has been democratized. What does that mean? That means that many of the tools in the application that I've shown you are actually available. You can use them now, you can use them tomorrow, and you can many of the applications that you have seen, you can actually use the tools to actually building them. I'm not saying that this is easy because you have, there is a lot of engineering involved, I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but the tools are available and they are available for free. Okay? So uh, there is critical mass in AI, a lot of people are working in AI. So the United States is just training 20 AI institutes investing you know, uh, billions of dollars there. Europe is about 20 billions of dollars invested in AI. China wants to have dominance in AI as well. So there are a lot of people working on this field. It's a field which is highly dynamic, progressing very, very fast. I was chair of the main conference, Triple AI, this year in AI, and we had more than twice as many submissions than last year, and it has further increased by 20%. So the number of researchers in AI is, is enormous at this point, and that pushes the field to move very, very quickly. So, so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, telling you how we achieve this. And so what I'm going to do is first dispel the myth, okay, telling you that all these things are actually pretty simple, fundamental. And I'm going to, so, remove the rabbit, you know, as, as, as every magic trick, okay? So at the end, it's very, you know, when you know how it works, it's extremely simple. So machine learning is about function mm -hmm. approximation. It's you take a function and you approximate it as accurately as you can. And I'm going to give a completely stupid example here for you. So this is a graph which tells you 
how much Nobel Prize winner a particular country is going to get uh, based on their consumptions of chocolate. Okay, I'm from Belgium originally, so we eat a lot of chocolate. That's why we have so many uh, Nobel Prize winners, given the size of the country. In Italy, I think you should switch from pasta to chocolate. That would increase the number of uh, prize winners. Uh, it's a completely stupid example. But what I want to show is that I want to learn, based on the consumption of, of chocolate, how much prize winner a country which is not in the list would have. And so what you do is a simple linear regression. Okay, most of you probably know this. But if you map this particular line on the set of data points that I've shown you, what you can do is, given consumption of chocolate, and then you get the number of Nobel Prize winners that you actually expect for that country. <laughs> this is the simplest possible machine learning pro you know, pro program. It was invented uh, you know, in, the seven, in the 18th century by this guy, Lejean, okay? And so what it, what it does essentially is trying to map this function, approximate the value of this function as a linear function of the data and some new ways that we have to find and a bias key. This is the only equation that I will show you, right? And so this is the data we want to find B, we want to find W. And how do we learn this? We basically try to minimize the error. Okay, this is called empirical risk minimization in machine learning for absolutely the wrong reason, but this is the name, okay? And this guy was a genius, uh, you know, this, it, he actually said that this function was actually very convenient. That's why he was using it. No, everybody uses that. So deep learning, what is deep learning? What is this thing that you hear in the press all the time? Well, take the linear regression that I've shown you and add a nonlinear component. So that's essentially what is called a neural, uh, 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 an artificial neuron, okay? And it's actually trying to model what is happening in the brain in terms of synapses and so on. And you know, there are, are reasonable analogies in some fashion. But then you take these things and you put them in a huge network, a huge amount of things. So you do this linear regression plus a nonlinear function and you put them, you know, in, in a very, very deep network like this. And so when you do that, essentially what you see is that the deep learning system is essentially a massive regression using a tremendous amount of data. And it, it's doing this massive linear regression and nonlinear regression actually over the, all this data. That's what it does. So when you're trying to see what a, so, so, so that was, you know, that was all, all very old, like 20, 30 years ago. What has been the breakthrough in that particular, uh, in that particular area for recognizing these various objects is called CNN, okay? Not the network. Not the network, but what is called convol convolutional neural networks. And this is actually, the way this was built was actually uh, by modeling what is happening in the brain of a cat. Okay, this is really what your, the brain of a cat is seeing. It starts with a bunch of pixels. Pixels are just, a, you know, a color range. That's what we have. And from that, the convolutional network is going to recognize shapes. And from this shape, it's going to recognize body parts or, you know, uh, or, or yeah, whatever whatever that body is, and then from there is the recognize the face. It recognizes different things, and this is you know this is a massive network in a sense. But that's what a deep neural net is doing, and it's basically inspired by neuroscience. So what is happening in speech recognition? That's exactly the same, except that it's a little bit more complicated because when you talk, my words have, the, have a context by what I just told you, right? So you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth now based on what I just. No, talked about. So you need to have some kind of memory or storage when you are actually feeding that neural net. And this is a net which is feeding on itself. And this is what Bloomberg News has said is one of the most important technical contributions of the last 20 years. Now, you have other things, and this is where the magic comes back because we don't really understand that. We understand regression very well, but you have also things like ensemble methods. And uh, I'm going to digress a little bit, and I'm going to ask you, when you see these things, what do you think about them? Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, right? So, why? Why? Okay? I just put three things there, and directly, you actually think about Sherlock Holmes. And this is the basis of what Watson is doing. In fact, when you see a lot of documents, when you see page, you know, web pages and so on, there is a very strong correlation between the concepts that you, the, the concept that you have in your mind and those words. And that's the first idea that is exploited in IBM Watson for beating Jenkins in Jeopardy. The second thing that you have is massive computing power. You can run many of these things at the same time. And then the third idea is ensemble method. Watson is asking a bunch of experts, you know, which are query, you know, Google or different things like this, different query answering system, and then he's trying to combine them to find an answer. And it ranks them probabilistically. So you basically ask a bunch of questions to expert, the expert, and then you, you basically combine their answers. 
So IBM Watson, if I ask this question, okay, don't ask it on the web now because everything has been corrected, but it would come, if you ask Google this, it would come to two answers, Toro and Cervantes. And obviously, you have the date there, and the date is basically removing one of the people from consideration, and you check the birth date, and you identify only one person. That's all Watson does. It's kind of essentially, once again, correlation, and then some kind of semantic verifications afterwards. So, you know, no magic, right? Okay, let me talk a little bit about the next, the near future of AI. So AI is going to impact every industry at this point. This is a, this is, you know, you can, this is what I did yesterday. I just say, hey, what, can I have a big, a nice picture for saying the impact? You can see almost every industry out there. And this is a quote by this uh, Oracle and venture capitalist in, in, uh, in Silicon Valley saying that the impact is going to be essentially everywhere. So let me, let me illustrate this using the airline industry and many of the concepts that I've just shown you. So the first one that they think, and this is easy to do, they want to predict what kind of meal uh, you, you are ordering on a particular plane. So I was on a plane to come from Atlanta to, to Paris, and they didn't have my particular the dishes that I wanted. Now, if you, if you fly EasyJet or a lot of the, uh, the, the Chinese airlines, they actually use machine learning to predict that what I wanted is the result of. Okay. Uh, so the revenue management systems that people have been using for many years is going to change completely. Once again, because they have a lot of data. They have a lot of data on when you go to the website and try to order a particular, a particular, a particular flight. They have also a lot of data about the survey they ask you to fill. You know, I know it's boring, but they ask you to fill these surveys all the time. So essentially what they're building is a lot more customer understanding. Every one of you will have a profile and they will give you the flights that you actually want to travel with, uh, on. Uh, some of the airlines are actually teaming up with Amazon to actually try to have chatbots to talk with you. What do you really want? You know, do you want to go to Hawaii? Do you want to go to Thailand? Whatever. So, but essentially they are basically you know, building all these systems so that they can know more and more about you. And so one of, one of the things that is going to happen is that in the next couple of years, these bots that you are doing and that you are interacting with will become multimodal. They will be your camera and they will be the text interaction so that they can see in your face, hey, what is this person actually thinking? I boarded the plane in Atlanta to come here without showing a passport, without showing a boarding pass. This is like your phone. Essentially, they recognize my face and they gave me, they gave me you know, my seats and all these things, but I didn't have to show a passport. So it's interesting. In China, I traveled for a week without showing the passport. Uh, you know, uh, putting your luggage is going to be exactly the same thing. Now, things are going to get more complicated with AI. The AI is going to take over the decision-making process as well. So uh, currently, the AI systems are very good for predicting delay. And some of the airlines, of the CEO of these airlines company, were wondering, but how can we do, you know, take an actionable, uh, you know, can all the, we turn this into something actionable? And at this point, what they do is that they are basically using this information to decide which flight to delay, which flight to cancel, how to reroute passengers automatically. And this is, uh, this is implemented all of Amsterdam at this point using uh, KLM. So now let me talk about the next AI and what is going to happen in the next couple of years. So the first thing that's going to happen is that AI is going to transform every engineering discipline. Civil engineering, you know, healthcare engineering, manufacturing, you know, uh, energy system and so on. And I'm going to give you some examples of this. Okay, the key challenge there is that you are going to deal with a lot more complicated examples. An image is just a bunch of pixels, you know, one end read by one end read. That's what you are learning. Here you will have to understand system which have to obey the physical laws or the biological laws or, you know, human engineering constraints. Okay, so let me, yeah, I'm going to skip this. So, so let me talk about manufacturing, right? So first industrial revolution. And this is from a movie that you probably, I, mean, I don't know, you are too young. But that, that some of us have actually looked at, you know, saying that work is completely dehumanized. So this is, this is what is happening now. So these are the robots actually doing this assembly line. But I want to show you something which is actually even more interesting. So let me sh make sure that this is actually starting. So these are the, the, the warehouses in, the, uh, in, uh, in an Amazon, uh, in an Amazon, this is an Amazon warehouse essentially. So these are robots. So one of the things on these pictures, look, there, are, there is nobody there, right? It's all robots. Are you, do you see any humans so far? Pretty cool, right? Yeah. I want to 
Okay, so look at a human. Okay, finally a human. Okay. Okay, so so the robots, you know, you see the robots, right? So they can do very, very specific stuff. They can move these things around. Okay, they can they can move these things completely automatically at this point. But one of the things they cannot do is is and they, they can beat every you know, they can beat Kastar off a chest. But one of the things that this robot cannot do is what this child is doing. You take the pawn and you move it forward, or you take the knight and you move it to the right position. They cannot do that. That's beyond the capability of robots at this particular point. So there are some human things that they still cannot do, and that's why they have humans in these Amazon warehouse to actually do the final packaging. Okay? So robots are not yet coming, right? So I want to show you how they can be used in transportation. This is one. So I'm going to tell you now that AI is going to take over every one of the societal challenges that we are facing. The first one is in transportation. This is Los Angeles. Okay, let me let, yeah, let me actually make Los Angeles move. Actually, I'm not even sure that it moves. Yeah, it moves a bit. Okay. So this is a highway in Los Angeles. You know, you see the lanes on both sides. In the last four years, they had two lanes on both sides to try to remove congestion. Okay, and what happened? Congestion actually increased. Okay, so basically, you see these massive, you know, traffic jams. I live in Atlanta, which is the eighth most congested city in the world. It's a little bit the same. Okay, so so people think that autonomous cars are going to solve this. Okay, so autonomous cars are going to solve all these. We can dispatch them everywhere we want. Okay, once again, I love movies, so let's see this movie. Oh, sorry. So you know this movie? How many, how many? Is it stalling? Come on, baby. <laughs> yes, yes, it's stalling. So this is one again a movie. If you want to know what AI is going to do in the future, just watch enough science fiction movie, and you will see where AI is going. Except that most of the time it's wrong. But this is about transportation. You're going to see. This is what I'm showing you. This. Minority Report. Yeah, very interesting movie. Because it precludes many of the things that I'm going to talk about today, actually. Many other things. And you can see there, you know, you see this massive highway, you see cars with one person in there, right? I'm insisting on this, one person. Okay, you're going to see Tom Cruise there, you know, in this thing. Come on, Tom, come on, Tom, stop, uh, stop talking to me. Yes, okay, Tom is there. Okay, so this is cute, right? So you can actually put it, you know, in the wrong direction. Okay? But all these cars there, there is one person in every car, right? So, so most of the cities now are basically forbidding Uber and Lyft and things like this. Paris wants free transportation, free public transportation for everyone. Why? Because a car is taking a lot of space for just one person. If you have a bus, you have a lot more people. It's the same place that you see there for this bus. It's all these cars. And fi you know, then we live in a world where the infrastructure is finite. Almost everything that we have is finite, right? And so you're going to say, okay, so public transportation is the issue. But if you look at public transportation, people hate public transportation. Because if you have to walk, if you, and if you have to walk a quarter, you know, 400 meters, a quarter of a mile, then you lose 90% of your ridership. People want to be picked up when they, you know, when they live, and they want to be dropped off where they want to go. So how do we start this? And this is where AI and uh, AI can make a huge difference. So look, the secret weapon of this is the phone. Because you have to talk to the system. But once you have the phone, you can design these completely new systems that are on demand, but they also deal with congestion by being make, make, make multimodal. And so this is one of the things that I want to show you. I want to show you visualization. This is something that is procurement in the city of Canberra, in the middle of nowhere in Australia. Very nice city. But what you see there, you see the buses. The buses are only going very, you know, congested area, dedicated lane. They go very, very fast. And the rest are the shuttles. They are bringing people to this dedicated, to this dedicated bus services. Completely dynamically based on who is ordering uh, the rides. And so you have this completely new system which is cost is half the price and where people travel half, you know, at half as fast. Okay? I want to show you something else, you know, uh, another system that we actually deployed in Michigan. I want to show you the system before and the system after. This is happening to me, so this is uh, So this is the system before, and once again, this is a transit system, heavily used, 50,000 people a day. Look at the buses here. You know, the size here is the number of people in the bus. As soon as you get also at this, you know, high, high, you know, high density corridor, there is no one in the bus. They are completely underutilized. Okay, this is in the evening. No, in the evening you have, you know, frequencies twice as long. And now you see all the students, the red bar, are the students waiting. They are waiting for a long time because the buses are not coming. Okay, so this is what we are doing once again. So and we deployed this last year. Come on, baby. So you know, see the shuttles that are basically servicing all the people. And if they have to go to the other side of town, then they will take a bus on an highly dedicated lane. And they go very, very fast. Okay? Uh, I'm going to skip this again. So, you know, this is the same thing for New York City. This is pretty cool, right? It's a million of rides every day. Okay, 30,000 rides an hour. Okay? And what you see there is we did exactly the same system with ride sharing. 
and you see blue are the people, blue are the, you know, the, the, the taxi which I use, uh, red, are the, uh, red or green, I, I don't know, I'm colorblind, so I probably don't see these objects like you do. Uh, but, but essentially these lines there uh, are, then in, are only showing when people are not used. And we could serve you know, these requests with a waiting time of about three minutes or two minutes, and decreasing the number of vehicles by about a factor of six. No, this is something that I typically don't show to people, but we are in Bologna, so I wanted to make sure that Mikhail was happy. So what we see there is that, you know, I asked my student to show the vehicle utilization. And you see all these vehicles, they are doing nothing. Because if I dispatch them at that particular point in time, they are going to increase the, you know, the, the waiting time. So when I saw that to my student, I said, you guys are really, really bad, right? So we have to do better than this. And so what we did is combining machine learning and optimization. And the machine learning system is basically telling me where the vehicle should be at any one time if they are not doing anything. And so what you see now is that no, no vehicle is underutilized, and we further decrease the, the waiting time by a substantial factor. That's, what, that's the kind of system we have in the future. Now, we have this particular shuttle. What are going to be the shuttle of the future? Now, some people are proposing these vehicles. What do you think? <laughs> no, no, right, so this is a losing proposition, right? So let me show you one that I like better. So this is actually very interesting. And this could fit very well the kind of things that I've just shown you. So these are very slow things, but they can actually be clustered together so that they move very fast on a dedicated lane. So they can be individual when you need them to be individual, but then they can become a bus when you need them to become a bus. And so this is the kind of things that the future is going to bring to us. The technology behind the scene is essentially the same. Uh, let, so the AI is going to be the same. It's about what people want to do and where these vehicles should be at any one time. Healthcare engineering. So Google is basically claiming that at this point, they can be better than radiologists in detecting cancer in patients. And so when I saw that, I was like very ambivalent. Do I want a machine? Do I want an AI actually diagnosing my potential cancer? But when I visited India, uh, China, they told me, but this is amazingly useful. You know, we have too many patients. And we don't have enough doctors. This is making the doctors so much more efficient. So this is going to come, whether we like it or not. They won't, the, the, the AI system may not make the decision, but at least they will help the doctors make faster decisions. Once again, Bed Island is the electricity. Have you seen this movie? Yes. The Island? Once again, if you see the future, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. So this, this is also kind of anticipating the future. These people are monitored all the time. because We want them to be healthy. It's like my watch except 10 times more powerful, right? And so this is what is happening. So we have devices like this. Now, for actually, this is for diabetes. So you have, you have these implants uh, checking at any point in time what is the blood sugar of, of, of this patient. And once you have this, you know, we, we can actually have, we can, have, we can start having personalized medicine, looking at your DNA, you look at every aspect of your body. And this is a slide from a, an amazing professor at Stanford, and it's basically saying that, no, we start from the genomes, look at your gene, and try to predict what kind of disease you're likely to develop, but at a very large scale. And then we have feedback loop to, to, to know how we can address these limitations. And so one of the things they're trying to do is look at the inside the machine learning system and try to go from the, from the, from the prediction into what explains that prediction, going back to the genomes and trying to see what the genomes is actually doing. And so uh, I'm going to skip on this because I probably don't have the time. Uh, but the same thing is happening in energy. So the energy systems are going to completely change in the future as well. I want just to show you one thing. So this is a new type of energy system in a small island in Kenya. Okay, this island didn't used to have electricity. Now with microgrids and the combinations of solar and wind, they can actually have electricity for everyone. These guys don't even have a bank account. They're actually paying everything with their phone. So Africa is actually skipping a generation in technology and actually using the, revolution, uh, the AI revolution to actually power some of these islands and smaller communities. So uh, let me skip this, and uh, this is all good. So let me talk a little bit about the limits of AI, because I think there are some interesting things to say there. One of the things that the AI system said is that they can be brittle. Uh, in this particular case, you, have, you recognize this panda. If I modify a little bit the pixels, okay, because that's what the computer sees, that's what your brain is actually seeing, a bunch of pixels. And so what, 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 if you modify it a little bit, what you would get sometimes is a classification as a given. Okay, that's not very good, right? So these systems can be a little bit brittle sometimes when, when you know, the, 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 the certainty about you know, the images initially is not very good. Uh, they also need to be trained carefully, and training is a very difficult and time-consuming process. It's a nonlinear process. We don't know how to do that very well. So we have to make progress in that area as well. Now, you have limitation in the data. So what this slide is telling you is that 
uh, the, 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 the AI systems can actually be better than the expert on some data sets that, you know, on the, on the kind of data that they've seen in the data set. If they don't see that data set, if they see outside that data set, they may not be that precise. So you have to be pay attention that what you learn is only what is in the data set. It's true for the AI system, it's true for you and I as well. If you have never seen something, it's very difficult for us to learn from it. Uh, so this is ELISA, probably nobody knows. This, is, this was kind of hot when I was a kid. And so this was a, essentially a natural language processing system, which was basically dealing, uh, you know, pretending to be a psychologist, invented by a professor at MIT. And people were actually talking to this AI program as it was a real psychologist, you know. And so the, 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 the author, Weizenbaum, was very, very, very worried that a computer would replace human. And he wrote this book, that I had to read as part of the class, uh, to, to the limit of what computers could do. And one of the things that he was arguing is the difference between deciding, which is a computation, and choosing, which is a human judgment. That's what he was articulating. I had to read this book also by another guy, what computer can't do. And there was all, all kinds of arguments saying that human, you know, humans could do, actually do things that computer would never do. And I wrote like a 50-page report saying, no, we are much better than computers. Uh, but the brain is a physical system. So the brain is to obey all the laws of physics. The brain is to obey all the biological laws as well. So why can't we actually replicate that? What's the limit? So these days, you know, I don't think that I would give me an A on, on you know, a high grade on that assignment because you are forgetting that everything which is in our brain is actually obeying all the physical laws. So can we build something that does exactly the same thing? Why not? It's not completely clear to me. So I'm asking you the question, right? So let me talk a little bit about the AI and the human experience. No, I have absolutely no qualification here. This is all my board looked like in my office, right? It's just math and algorithm. The only thing that I know about neuroscience, about medicine, about philosophy, is what I learned from my kids. Okay, so my, my daughter is a neuroscience major and she's in medical school, and my son is an history major and a philosopher, right? Could not be more different. One is 5'2", you know, well, I think 150, 150 centimeters. The other one is like 190. Okay, completely different kids, right? And so what I'm going to tell you is, you know, essentially what they, you know, what they think, not what I think. Okay, so this is an interaction that I had with my daughter a couple of days ago. So I'm, 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 she is very annoyed with me because I'm always asking questions that she cannot answer. You know, one of the things that I asked her when she started neuroscience, why do we wake up? She was like, uh, 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 and she could not answer at that time. No, I have the answer to that. But it's, it's like a, a question that you and I would ask if, you know, if we know nothing. Okay, and she is basically asked, no, no, she has an answer to her, every one of our questions. She is basically saying, why is not a great question in biology? Why is not a great question in medicine? We don't care. Okay, what we are doing is fixing things. So, right, it's very interesting. So in AI, we have a lot of bias. Okay, so we are afraid of bias. Why? Because most of these data sets are, let's say, representing decisions that have been doing by humans. So if you learn from a system which has a bias, then what's going to happen? You're going to reproduce these, these bias, but you are going to reproduce them at massive scale, right? And this is very, very dangerous, okay? So AI should probably not be used, very, if you're not using them very carefully, for ranking the credit score of the people, for doing hiring decisions, or for, you know, making judgment instead of judges, unless you can actually solve the bias problem, right? Another question is, is this the end of privacy? Obviously, you guys have a less, much less concern than we had about privacy, but is this the end of privacy? So a lot of the, the, the data that we want to acquire is difficult to acquire because, you know, during the Obama administration, they wanted to release a lot of data that then people expressed concerns, like saying, well, but we don't want, you know, individuals to be identified, and then they stopped doing this. Uh, but, you know, when you look at different hospitals and they have data about very many of you, and every hospital has a data set, which may be different, you know, one may be a woman hospital, another one is like a children hospital, but some of the diagnoses are the same, and you could learn from both of them, but they cannot share. So if you would share, you would have a much higher precision. How can you do that? And the key point is that, once again, you know, this is an issue that we have to address, and this is called federated learning, and you can use, actually, techniques from differential privacy to do that. Let me give you an example, okay? So assume that I want to find out, in the University of Bologna, how many people are smoking marijuana, okay? Delicate question. Is it, is, is, is it legal to smoke marijuana in, in, in Italy? No. Okay? And then, I assume that some of you are doing that, okay? So like, <laughs> but I don't know, but I want to find out, okay? But I want to find out without identifying any of you. So what can I do? What can I do is I, I can ask you to run this mechanism here. You flip a con, and if the answer is the hat, okay, of the con, 
Then you answer truthfully. You tell me yes or no if you are using, you know, smoking marijuana. Or you tell the, yeah, the system if you are using marijuana. Otherwise, you flip another coin and you say yes or no. <coughs> and this mechanism, if everybody is using it, okay, is going to make me capable of actually predicting very, very accurately how many people are smoking marijuana on this campus. And at the same time, every one of you should not be worried about everything because if, some, if somebody tells you, hey, you have been using marijuana, you can then, oh, no, 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 I flipped this coin. It was completely, it was still, and then this said, yes, but I'm not spoken, mm -hmm. right? And so you can use things like that to actually recover privacy in this system, okay? Uh, this is a much bigger problem. A lot of, you know, a, a lot of people now are very worried that a lot of people will have no work because most of things are going to be automated. Now, in the past, when you had the Industrial Revolution, we created work. Are we going to create work this time? It's not completely sure. Okay? I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. So, and what are we teaching to people is going to be very different. Okay? So, you're not going to teach the same skills. So, this is one of the difficult issues. Uh, but what do humans want the most? Can you tell me what you want? What you really want? What? So, the, the previous speaker uh, talked about these books, right? Okay, so one of the things they say in that book is that what human wants is eternal life. Okay, and that's what we want. Can the things that we and, and actually actually it's very interesting because people are saying that for the last you know the last 20 years we have been living longer and longer and longer. But this is not really true. Galileo actually lived for this. It was 78. It's in the average that we are living longer. But you know people are believing that we can make you know humans they live a lot longer. So this is an article that, you know the, the, the thing that I show you about my daughter was coming from this particular article here. And so you can do gene editing though, make people you know uh, live longer through that. Uh, some people actually don't want to live longer because they say yeah uh, the brain is gonna is gonna be damaged at some point and therefore I don't want to have dementia even if I can fix everything else. But no, people are basically saying, oh yeah, but I can stimulate your memories inside your brain using chips. I could actually put chips in your brain so that we can have a much better memory <coughs> and we do these things. Okay? I would claim that these things are very limited at this point because it's not because you give me a big memory in my, in my, in my brain that I will make a connection that we as human beings can actually do. Uh, but you know, people are going to explore these things. And then people are worried that at some point the AI system is going to be more intelligent than us and that po and that point they're going to take over and the humanity is going to disappear in one way or another. So in a sense that's what I, you know, these are all questions, okay? So, you know, this is what I do to my daughter. I'm asking you questions. What do you think? I don't have answer to any of these questions. So what I wanted to tell you is that AI has already transformed many things, perception in particular. Uh, but the, re the AI revolution is also going to change, you know, decisions at this point. Uh, basically through machine learning and optimization, and it's going to transform every discipline in engineering. There are fundamental limitations currently, but you know, once again, if I think of myself when I was, you know, uh, your age, I think I would have a very different answer of what can be learned, what a computer can do. I don't think, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to say that this is what the computer can do or cannot do. It's a physical system. So we, the brain is a physical system. We could emulate it to, to a large extent, in a sense. Uh, but also AI is raising a lot of um, a lot of issue from a societal standpoint, privacy, bias, inequality, and transformation of the human experience. How we deal with this is going to be critical of the future of the human being. And once again, you know, I think some of these things have technological um, solution, but some don't. And so, how do we deal with this? Is kind of a is outside, you know, my my area of expertise and also my outside scientific, you know, discourse in a sense. It's a political decision. So that's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Professor Mackenzie. It was a really interesting talk. Um, again, good questions. <coughs> You spoke about uh, the, the, the democratization of machine learning in the beginning of your talk. And I recently listened to a podcast that was speaking uh, about machine teaching and whatever the, the professor that was speaking called his uh, research field. And he said that the bad thing about uh, democratizing is that everybody wants to democratize and he wanted his research field to be more ambitious than that. So, um, since you mentioned that uh, I don't know, mm, doctors are using uh, machine learning to um, discover skin cancer or something like. But 
Uh, for example, the computers in the hospital in my city upgraded to Windows XP in 2015. So, uh, do you think that this democratization will inhibit further research on AI and machine learning, or that um, computer scientists will continue to do research and then it will be applied when it's done or when other fields want it to apply? So, so, so good question. So the first thing that I can tell you, I was using democratizing in a very positive fashion by making, by, by just letting you that the technology is available in many fields. You have IP requirements and things like this. At this point in, in time, you can use some of the best machine learning algorithm for free, and that's a technology, a technology enabler. So when I say democratizing, it means that you and I can actually use it. We don't have to pay for it. Now your question is, is actually. It's actually different in a sense. You are asking me if the fact that we make that available is going to limit uh, is going to limit the, the other things that we are doing. Okay. So I think technology deployment is always going to be there. Will be always a distance between the research and what you are doing, what you are deploying in the field, because you have all kinds of regulations that you have to satisfy and things like this. It's less so in China, for instance, than it would be in Europe or in the United States when you use one of these programs. But I think it's still there will still be a difference between what we do in research and what we actually do in a. In, 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 the, in when you deploy in the field. But one of the things that is happening now is that the distance between the time you invent something and the time you are deploying it is, is much shorter. Although I have to be, you know, tell you that you know, neural nets have been investigated since the 1950s. But at this point, they are mature. And then once they are mature, the distance to, to, to commercialization is very, very small these days. Because people want some of these techniques and they have a big impact on societal issues. And I think that's what is happening. So you can start solving really Problems that are faced by humanity, I'm, I didn't have to talk about power system, but this is one of the areas that I'm the most excited on because it tackles probably the most you know, critical challenge of all time, which is climate change. And so I think, you know, uh, I think, I think we are in a stage where these technologies can be used really now for solving some of these problems, at least partially. Okay? Thank you. <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, when you were speaking about the advancement in AI, yeah. uh, I, I'll take a guess and suppose that you were mainly speaking about ma ma machine learning. No, not really. I'm talking about machine learning and optimization of right. the together because this, this is really where I think the progress is going to be relaxed. So you basically, perception, computer vision, natural language processing is very well understood. More computer vision than natural language processing, but essentially it's very, very well solved. And the, the progress is going to be slow, but integrating decision making is much more complicated. And so what you want is kind of this end-to-end -end system, decision-making system, where you learn and then you decide, and this is in the feedback loop. I think that's what is going to happen. So if when you do a transportation system, that the one that I've shown you, you do machine learning and optimization together. Behind the scene, there is a very sophisticated optimization program to dispatch these fleets. And then there is also machine learning to know how to best dispatch. So my machine learning is, is learning about my optimization and how I can improve my optimization. Okay, but there's still a lot of engineering behind the scene on how to connect them. But, but this is, I think that the real frontier now is AI, in AI, is basically machine learning together with optimization and together with human modeling human behavior and with mechanism design, things like this. Uh, game theory, for instance. That's where the, I think the future is. Other questions? No more questions? I mean, the body temperature here is pretty high. What is my body temperature? <laughs> 98, yeah, yeah that's not good. Yes, sir? Yeah, you, you were talking about the, democ the democratization of the machine learning algorithms. But uh, one, of, one of the major issues that make it uh, unavailable for a lot of people is the fact that they require a lot of computing power. I mean, yeah. I tried to, to train a Resident 100, and it took me like a month on my, on my small computer. Yeah. Do you think that uh, there, will, there will be a divide between the the mega companies like Amazon and Google that can train models like GPT-2 yeah. or things like that, and the poor uh, backyard uh, researcher that will instead work uh, on, uh, on smaller problems? Or do you think that there will be some, some sort of convergence? Yeah, yeah. The so I think it's a great question. It's a fantastic question. I'll answer it in several steps. So, so let me start with a very positive news. So I went, I went to Africa uh, in uh, end of June, and I was, expecting, I was not expecting to see what I was seeing. So I was seeing that, as I told you, that they were skipping a generation in terms of the energy production, that they were actually using microgrid, things that are not even in use very much in, in the US except for limited, limited campuses and so on. They were using that for communities and high communities. So sometimes you know, people are skipping a generation. Now the first thing that people, so these communities in Africa are buying is a phone. The phone is freedom for them. 
Uh, basically, you don't have to go to a bank and ask for a bank account. They have their phones. As soon as they put money with, on it, they can buy electricity. They can buy plenty of things that they could not buy before. So they completely remove the banking system. It's amazing. So first, first, I think you, you can skip a generation. Okay, I was very worried in the U.S. that the kind of the fact that we're building this new transportation system, we rely on on the phone, was was dangerous. But when I saw that in in in, in uh, in Africa, I said, no, probably that's not going to be the case because people are going to, if, if you have a service which is very useful to this community, to poorer people, they will have the phone because they need the phone. And a real a phone for these purposes doesn't have to cost very much. It can be 20, 20 euros or less, right? So that's the second answer. The third answer is that for the computing power, I think what we should build is this kind of microgrid where you team up, uh, you know, solar energy and, and this massive computing, <coughs> computing, uh, computing system. And then you basically run them without actually, uh, you know, emitting greenhouse gas, and, and, and it becomes available to everyone. You just have to build, you know, one of these microgrids, and then you can make that available. So my group, and you know, and the first thing that I ask when I, you know, join Georgia Tech is build me a, you know, build me a, a high performance computing so that my students don't have your experience. And so the campus is a microgrid, so it's going to be completely automated and, and powered by essentially renewable energy. So I think you are right to worry about inequalities. When you build a system, you have to think about them. But I think technology can also, you know, people can skip a generation if you make it affordable enough or attractive enough to them. If it can bring them to another level, in, you know, the social hierarchy, in a sense. Okay. No, it's a very good question. Can I ask another yes. one? Uh, you, yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, I realized you kind of uh, during the presentation yeah. uh, about AGI. I recently learned about a um, hot take by Andrew Ng. Uh, yeah. Who was just saying there's no point in there's no real point in safety research on AGI at this present moment because we're not even like remotely close to even knowing how we could get there. Do you have some kind of hot take that is somewhat similar to this, or do you think no? We should really focus on uh, <coughs> ethics studies and uh, safety studies on, on, on like pre preparing for if. So, so my point is that there are two things that needs to happen. If you deploy a system, if you deploy a system, it has to be completely tested in condition in which it's going to be used. So you have to understand that you're using an AI system, that this other limitation, it was trained on this type of data. And if you are not using it on the same kind of data, it should not be used. Or the system has to be able to flag that, hey, I don't know about this. Okay, so this is what my group is doing, for instance. So we are basically building systems. And we are trying to recognize that this is being used in a, in a way that we don't, we don't know the answer and we can resort to something else. The second thing is that the ethical issues have to be discussed. And as scientists, we, we are responsible to that. And we have to educate the public. We have to educate the public of what the technology can do and what are the, the issues that it's raising. And it's very important that we do this and that we do this vocally. Because uh, it's too easy to use this technology in a very bad fashion. It's already happening. And so you have to basically educate the public in, in general in a non-confrontational fashion to say, these are the dangers that this technology poses. But we have to do it in a positive fashion. I was giving a technical talk earlier this morning. And, and many of these issues have actually technological solutions, scientific and engineering solutions. And you have to basically say, this is an issue, and this is all we can address. So I worked in Australia. I had, a, I had a fantastic research group of 70 people. And I was reporting to the CEO of the center. And the CEO had one rule for me in, way, in, in, way, in the way I was communicating uh, to, to him. He said, well, any message you send to me cannot be longer than one line. And if you raise a problem, you bring a solution. So I think as scientists, we should basically, if we raise a problem, we should also bring solution that people can discuss. Otherwise, we're putting people in a very difficult position. So that's my, you know, on this ethical and, and, and you know, societal issues, I think that's what we have to do. We have to basically say, these are the issues. These are the way you could tackle them. And, and then, you know, you have politicians who can make the decision, they are paid for that. Other questions? Yeah. Yes? Sorry, any prediction on the effects of quantum computing on the AI <laughs> field? So, <laughs> it's a good question. I have absolutely no, no answer for you. I was very skeptical. Yeah. Uh, I'm still very skeptical. Mm -hmm. But I've learned that, you know, it's good to be skeptical, but also not to make any, any judgment, uh, too early <laughs> judgment. So, so I think they will have limitations, and we already know some of these limitations, but they can be useful in some setting if they, if they, are, if they are actually, uh, you know, can be implemented uh, at large scale. I think the next two years are going to be very interesting, because I think it's going to come uh, or break in the next two years. That would be one prediction. They are claiming that they can scale it. I think we'll see in the next two years if they can scale. If they can scale, 
then I would watch this very, very carefully. But at this point, I'm still very skeptical. But once again, it's a positive skepticism. I'm not ruling that they can actually do interesting things. I know some of the limitations, but you know, it, you know, I, I've learned in my, you know, I have learned that many of the predictions that I did in the past were wrong. So, uh, so I think it's interesting, and it should be followed very carefully. And we'll know more in two years time. Okay. Thank you very much. Really appreciate all the questions. Thank you. So thank you again, Professor Van Hendrik. And our last talk uh, will be by Dr. Gabriele Giacomini. Uh, he graduated in philosophy at the University of Udine. Right? Uh, the first graduation. Yeah, and then here they have PhD from the Vita Salute San Rafael University in Milan and also from the US institution uh, from the University of Pavia, which is also part of the ASC2, the network of excellent schools. Uh, so please welcome uh, Dr. Gabriel. tutti, grazie, grazie per l'invito alla direttrice della scuola Federico e alla professoressa Milano che ha suggerito eh, la mia presenza qui, grazie per il graditissimo invito. Eh, il mio inglese è scolastico, vi chiedo scusa di ciò, eh, però insomma, cercherò almeno, almeno di essere chiaro e di passare uno dei tre concetti, una delle tre tesi che sono presenti appunto nel mio ultimo libro il cui titolo è Potere Digitale. In recent decades, the great development of the Internet has allowed information sources to multiply. By going online, everyone can publish, share and spread ideas, opinions, information, easily and at very low cost. Web 2.0 applications are designed with an interface that allows even inexperienced users to publish text and multimedia content easily, to express their idea and share content. In the context of new media, it is now easy for consumers to become producers of information. And over the years, more and more people have been entering the digital public sphere. Just as the invention of mobile character printing increased the amount of information available, the Internet is doing something similar. Enriched by the Internet, the media system becomes quantitatively broader than the traditional system. It grows larger and more numerous and increases the amount of information available overall. We could therefore say that pluralism understood as quantitative in the strict sense that is, as the number of sources of information is growing. It is also growing in the qualitative sense, however. In this speech, I tend to cast doubt on this notion. Indeed, various studies on echo chambers, filter bubbles, seem to suggest that a quantitative increase in information sources is not followed by a linear increase in qualitative pluralism. The origin of the problem is in people's mind. In fact, individuals have bound rationality. They are unable to process the immense amount of information on the Internet. Therefore, we run the risk of undermining the possibility of pluralism, becoming a reflective dialogue as opposed to a mere differentiation of voices. But what is pluralism? 
Pluralism, pluralism is a concept that should not be approached in a naive way. Common sense holds that pluralism is characteristic of democracy. <coughs> However, pluralism is not descriptive or factual, but rather normative and concerns the sphere of ideas and values. According to the pluralist ideal, diversity and dissent are values that protect freedom and, at the same time, enrich both the individual and the public sphere by creating a dialogue between different viewpoints. This qualitative nature of pluralism was clearly demonstrated by Giovanni Sartori. As Sartori emphasizes, pluralism not, does not mean a mere division between a certain number of different opinions, nor does it mean poor sight-taking. Rather, it means that the different parties should enter into relationship between one another within the political community, becoming positive components of the whole. In order to produce pluralism, different parties need to interact with one another within a single system, the political community, in order to produce a concordia discourse, a consent driven by disagreement. Let's consider the example of medieval factions and modern parties. There were very many political factions within the medieval Italian municipalities, for example, Guelph Bianchi, Guelfineri, Ghibellini. They were plural in this sense, but only in quantitative terms. In fact, when someone lost an election, they were often sent into exile, as happened to, to Dante Alighieri. There are also numerous modern <coughs> political parties, as there are plural factions in a quantitative sense, but political parties have something extra. That something extra is authentic pluralism, understood in a qualitative sense. The modern parties are adversaries, but they engage with each other by entering into dialogue. They diverge on the public policies to be implemented, but share the rules of the game. In a quantitative pluralist system, if you lose the election, you go into exile. In a qualitative pluralist system, if you lose the election, you go to the opposition, meaning you have a right to speak and to continue to address what you think differently to you. This view of qualitative pluralistic comparison is also found in the Habermas theory of the public sphere, which is centered on the idea of a principle of discourse <coughs> as the basis for rational, free and critical, but constructive debate. There is a huge difference between quantitative pluralism and qualitative pluralism. Returning to the popularity of digital communication technologies, I have the impression that the paradox of pluralism is emerging. While quantitative pluralism is increasing, there is a risk that qualitative pluralism, pluralism will diminish. In fact, a kind of dissonance seems to have been initiated with the advent of digital media. There is a a misalignment between the quantitative level and the qualitative level. The media increase everyone's possibility of expressing their voice in quantitative terms, but at the same time, and in a paradoxical way, it also seems to increase the distance between these voices, making it difficult to achieve the goals that the pluralist political system should have in qualitative terms. On the one hand, the internet has exponentially increased the opportunities for individuals, groups, and organizations to express their particular worldview independently, favoring the plural expression of, diff of different point of view. On the other hand, recent studies show that there is a widespread online tendency for people to discuss things with those who have a similar orientation to themselves, and almost exclusively. For example, we could refer to the analysis bus by Cassast in the USA or by Walter Quattrociocchi in Italy. Search engines like Google customize the searches for each user, creating a world in their image and likeness. 
We could think of social networks like Facebook, which profile users and through precise algorithmic choices offer content that stay close to their ideas, limiting the possibilities of random encounters. By very impulsive nature and their bandit rationality, human beings tend towards homophily, which is to say they frequent people similar to themselves. The algorithmic customization of content and information practiced by large platforms reinforces this dynamic even more. This happens for commercial purposes, because users who, have, who, have offered, who are offered content in line with their thinking take more pleasure in staying on the online platform. The negative effect of this is that, according to numerous empirical studies, there is a growing polarization of opinions on the internet and in social media. Individuals and groups become more and more closed in their views. They stay in their echo chambers, avoid interaction with those who think differently and limiting themselves to engaging with those who think in a similar way. In this way, they lead to the risk that pluralism results in a mere differentiation of voices rather than a debate with as much dialogue as possible as part of an imperfect consensus corroborated by the confrontation between different opinions. We run the risk of undermining the possibility of pluralism becoming a concordia discourse, as opposed to a mere differentiation of voices. However, the web does not, not only consist of social networks or search engines, even if certainly have a significant role they may be online communication practices capable of reversing or at least reducing the trend of the pluralism paradox, enhancing the rational component of the human mind. An ideal dialogue in terms of both quantity and quality can continue to be practical in some contexts. For example, civic participation platforms may limit the impulsive and emotional mechanism of the paradox pluralism. Participatory platforms enable tools for dialogue with and between citizens, for sharing knowledge and promoting collaborative processes. Above all, they do not promote customized filters because the public administration upholding them not, do not have commercial aims. From this point of view, the city of Udine was an example for the promotion of, of horizontal participatory <coughs> platforms. They have been various information and participation initiatives, but, but here we will mention two, two platforms. The, the first open municipio, the first open municipio user can, without discrimination, consult all the administrative deeds, which are not selecting according to the user's taste, but are always available. It was therefore a platform for information and transparency inviting citizens to engage in an in-depth learning activity. The second e part is a civic platform for participation and collaboration in which citizens report the city's problem to the administration. The reports are visible to everyone and trigger a dialogue process between citizens and the administration. This diffuses certain dynamics typical of social networks in which citizens complain to the administration without the administration being able to reply point by point. In the case of the part, a kind of communication is enabled that goes into the merits of the issue and is certainly more reflective. Especially in environments such as those of civic platforms, there are traces of dialogic confrontation that seem to be able to bring out the more reflective and argumentative aspects of users' thinking. The paradox of pluralism found in social networks can be limited by increasing the practices of dialogic confrontation. While it is true that many studies have registered the phenomenon of encastellation among closed digital communities, it is equally true that there is no shortage of Marco Polos who travel on new paths and who meet with the other as openly as possible. It is the second type of confrontation that is promoted by pluralism understood in a qualitative sense and which defended from the crisis caused by excessively polarized confrontation as often appears to occur online. 
In conclusion, the phenomena of paradox of pluralism and the castellation mean that the ideas of the public sphere and democracy must be tested by the conduct of political actors in real life, including in light of communication and technological changes. Habermas theorized the concept of public sphere in history and critic of public opinion, in which he referred to publicly accessible debates, a place of interaction between private citizens that becomes pub public when the conversation, conversation hinge on issues that are of general interest. When conducting a historical analysis, Habermas associated the 17th century coffee houses with the birth of a public sphere, a, a space where people of different classes could speak about public issues without fear of being arrested. In continuity with the idea of public sphere, Habermas also identifies a model of democracy. In between fact and norms, Habermas places the principle of discourse at the apex of the value and justification of democracy. Democracy should be seen as a discursive process based on the exchange of reason that aim to define a framework of legitimate legal rules where citizens can see themselves as free and equal. <laughs> However, even the historic, historical research conducted by Laurier and Philo on the English coffee houses of the 18th century, while not neglecting the importance and value of a public discussion on issues regarding the state, report that the public sphere was from the outset a precarious dimension. In the coffee houses, the Habermasian ideal manifested itself more in an overly excited exchange between people than in an educated, measured, and inclusive discussion between talking heads. For example, even by the second half of the 20th century, the public sphere has yet to be fully achieved. Habermas himself is aware of the difficulties the ideal might encounter in his concrete application, especially in the post-war society characterized by the spread of the mass media and the technique for the promotion of advertising, non to mention the agenda-setting effect the television system dominated by a small number of channels could have on citizens. New problems have been identified in digital media as a result, for example, of a phenomenon of a castellation that is linked to both cognitive mechanisms and the algorithm of large platforms. <coughs> In light of these considerations, the model of the Habermasian public sphere and the concept of dialogic democracy might be reconsidered. Future lines of research should examine means of recalibration using a multidisciplinarity approach. We believe that the concept of imperfect dialogic democracy could reflect the tension between the normal value of a reasoned debate and the concrete conditions that have to fulfill this process, including with regard to the emergence of digital media, especially in terms of the phenomenon of the paradox of pluralism. Indeed, why rights and freedom of thought association and expression represent the best political institutional conditions for a dialogue that is inclusive and complete as possible, based on the ideal of Concordia discourse, in reality this, object, this objective is partially achieved, including as a result of a characteristic of the, of the media, also digital media. We just have to think of the castellation caused by the Plat algorithm of large platform. Grazie per l'attenzione. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, your question. Do we do I have to answer? <coughs> okay, so I guess there are no questions.
Uh, we can move on with the panel discussion. Don't worry, it will not be too long. <laughs> um, <coughs> Okay, well, thank, thank you, everyone. To, you're still alive. That's amazing. Uh, I was looking ahead of me, so of course, I couldn't see you on the back. It's amazing. That, um, so we are open a, a brief discussion. I'm just going to share it briefly, just a flow controller. And, but I'm going to use my privilege to ask the first two questions, <laughs> because I have no concern how I have the problem. And I'm going to go with philosophy first, because what you were saying, it reminds me of something in my, uh, in my youth. It was called radio consciousness. They were, I don't know who put it up, it was a theory or something. There, there was this crazy idea that the brain was like a radio receiver and consciousness was the radio frequency. And so you had many different radios and each radio would pick a different program or a different show. And is it something that, am I saying something stupid or does it resemble something that, yours, that you said? <laughs> well, yeah, actually, there is some similarity in the notion that, uh, in the negative part, so right. the notion that there's no consciousness inside the brain, there's no homunculus inside the brain. Uh, but there's a difference because in, in the <coughs> model of radio consciousness, there is still the idea that um, the brain has to pick up a consciousness from the environment, yeah. while in, in my model, nothing is picking up anything. Okay. And the, the consciousness is outside and stays outside. So it doesn't need to be picked up. Um, actually, Daniel Dennett, in 1987, wrote a very famous uh, philosophical novel called um, um, Where Am I? in which he claimed that we have no evidence about the place where we, are, where we are based on the fact that the sensory information is centered around our body. So he made the case that in principle we could take our brain, we could remove our brain and uh, keep it alive in a life support system and as long as it is connected with Wi-Fi with our body, all our experiences will be exactly like the one that we have, only that if we, in the hypothesis that we believe to be inside our brain, we would be elsewhere. So from the fact that we perceive the world centered around, of, uh, around our body, we have no evidence that we are at the center of such sensation. So once we uh, admit that, that we have no evidence about the place where we are, like Sherlock Holmes once said, the, the, the only alternative that, we are still, uh, that is still available must be the right one. Namely, we are not in the brain, but we are elsewhere. Right, that's interesting. So, you're, so the senses are not a filter that allows the reality to build consciousness inside our brain. Or is everything put it outside? But how, do, how are you going to measure it then? Like coming back to your criticism at right. the beginning. So what, if you say what is outside, what is it? What is it? Yeah, very good point. Well, first, let me say something about this notion that we build uh, our own reality. And, uh, I mean, in our culture, we always believe that uh, the world that we see is built by our brain, that the world is colorless and that color, for example, are created by our brain. This is a very common claim. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever, and, and therefore, people, to connect with AI, people believe that we see a virtual world created by our brain somehow. So we see a model of reality. We don't see reality as it is, because reality as it is is outside, is out of reach. But let me ask you a question. I mean, here we're using a metaphor taken from computer science, namely the metaphor of virtual reality. But, and we take that metaphor from movies. In movies, usually they put you a little device on your head, and then all of a sudden you are in the Matrix world. You are in, in San Junipero's world. Well, let me ask you a question. Has anyone, anyone, ever seen 
a virtual color. No, because the real virtual reality devices require physical colors in front of our eyes. So we see little tiny screens. What about dream? What about dream? A very good point. Has anyone ever dreamt of a color that we haven't met in our life? Has anyone ever dreamt of uh, something that was uh, not a combination of moments that we met in our previous life? So if our brain had a color box machine, I uh, guess that sooner or later something would go wrong. So from the fact that all our dreams seems to be just a reshuffling of our real life, I see that there is strong evidence that dreams too are bound by the actual world and not built by the, uh, some internal machinery. So my, my reply is that even dreams, and that's actually a big part of my work and the hallucination, I've been working a lot of them and that's one of the main topic of my research, may be seen rather than as uh, virtual worlds, as a delayed reshuffled perception of the external world. So basically we perceive the world in many ways and we gave the word perception only to the last uh, and the most recent uh, piece of the world. When we are uh, isolated from the external environment, we perceive our more extended um, life, and we call that kind of perception dreams. Okay, well, thank you. That was, that was interesting. Uh, a little digging in the rabbit hole, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to use my privilege to you now. <laughs> because it, that, that's what it, it served me this question to reach you. Because you were claiming that um, the brain is a physical object, right? And yeah, I agree. I agree. I'm not going to hear this good at that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so we could rebuild it. And uh, and I I agree, we make brain every day, mm -hmm. like the millions of every baby that born has a brain and it develops and, and, and it works most of the time. And uh, so do you think there is something special in the hardware of the brain that allows human to reach this kind of performances that differentiated from the AI basic, which now is based on, on, on uh, binary silicon transistors, and what the brain is very, very different architecture. So what, what's your opinion on that? So, so I think uh, uh, the numerous the, the way to answer this. First, I think it's more than a physical brain, it's also bi biological, right? So yeah. I think a lot, of the, a lot of the sensation we feel are basically based on biological processes, and you are you, you you have this sensation because you have some biological processes you know happening in your brain, and the, the fact that you have pleasure or pain it's a, it's a it's a it's a biological process. Obviously, this biological process has to follow the laws of physics as well. I think the so so that's the first thing. What was the, uh, so the overall question? So the, the other thing that you have is that part of us is also biological and chemical, right? So. Uh, the eyes, you know, you are seeing pixels, essentially, it's about, you know, it's colors that you're seeing. And, all, and, and you see them differently that, that uh, Ricardo sees them, and I, I see them, I, actually, I don't see them. But, but we still recognize objects, and, and we agree on many things, although, I mean, Ricardo and I don't see the colors in the same fashion. So I think that there is something that we see and we agree upon uh, to, a, to a certain extent. But I think we also, the smell is not digital at all, right? So it's a, it's a chemical process. And that's very interesting because people are building chemical computers these days as well. So we are combinations of chemical, biological, and physical digital system, right? So, but there is nothing that prevents us to try to build this thing again, right? So of course, if 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 we are building a chemical, you know, biological computer, you have to feed him sugar and and all kinds of things. But there is nothing that prevents us to actually trying to replicate the brain. Now, the brain is extremely complicated, so I think it and is very poorly understood even by neuroscientists. So there is no way we can actually do these things at large scale at this point. But you know, once again, I, you know, as I told you, I want to be cautious. I don't know what we will be able to understand. And I, once you understand things, it's not completely clear to me that you could not replicate it, right? So and at least part part of it. And then, what does it mean for a question of conscience? You know, being being conscious and so on. Maybe this is something like that just emerged because of this physical and biological process. 
and we just don't understand it yet, right? So maybe there is nothing special about consciousness. It's just the fact that you are, you know, having this physical system, and then this physical system, you know, is actually, you know, having this this particular physical, you know, reaction. So we don't know that. We have no absolute no clue to dispel this. It may be true. It may not be true. We don't know. I mean, it's like when you, you know, when you when you when you dispatch electricity, you are creating an electromagnetic field. This thing doesn't. It's impossible to imagine. I mean, it's very difficult to imagine. We actually had to measure it to, to know that it's there. But if you, the electron are creating these fields, which have nothing to do, gravity is, you know, kind of, gravity is, is amazing as well, right? So it's like something that is actually linking two planets, which are not, you know, initially we, don't, we didn't know they were connected, right? So all these things we're discovering. So there is nothing that actually excludes the fact that consciousness is not, it's not a physical or biological process happening in the brain, that we just, you know, don't recognize and it may be part of the complexity because also consciousness is not yes or no right so if you have a cat or the dog or a monkey or a, you know a, a dolphin you know consciousness is basically a, it's, it's something that is gradual right so some of these animals are very close to consciousness like we have it some of them are further away so you know they have a different brain smaller brain sometimes bigger brain but they have a different brain so it's not completely clear to me that this is not a side effect of the physical and biological and chemical properties of the brain. So I, I don't want to exclude it. Oh, right? no, so, I guess uh, the idea that consciousness is as an empty phenomenon is very diffuse, like right? it's a common theory that, that is something arising. And, and I'm going to follow up for a moment on, on your response. Uh, but what about energy consumption? Like compared to, to a supercomputer, the brain has a great advantage. It works with an apple, but a supercomputer requires a nuclear plant to to work. So, in the long prospect of scaling, biological intelligence seems much more scalable compared to what, uh, um, let's say, um, transistor-based uh, artificial intelligence could be reaching. Uh, or oh, yeah. am I wrong? I want to address this. So, yeah, okay, sure. so, so I think, I think you know, when did humanity start? Billions of years ago. We are, we are the process. Oh, well. Five million. Five million. Yeah. Five million. So we have five million years of training of a huge amount of people here. And, you know, I think that that's what you see. The brain has been evolving. It's natural selection. And so this has been the training. Now we are trying to train computers to do some of these tasks. Obviously, it's going to take some time before they get trained. The key point is that can you train them such that the next generation of computer can be trained from the training that has happened before. And so I think you, you have, and also the brain is not very efficient in a sense. So... Uh, I think yeah. a, a computer is actually, if you measure it in terms of the number of operations that it's performing, it's actually much more performing, much more performant than our brain. But not it's in, much faster. Not in terms of energy usage. Oh, it, yeah, yeah. I think it, in terms of, if I'm correct, if I remember correctly, even in terms of energy usage, it's actually performing much more operation at a at a lower energy state. So but a brain once again, is we have one point five watts. It's like a ball. The brain? Yeah. So yeah. my brain, your brain, everyone's brain works with a light bulb. So Why a supercomputer would require a yeah, yeah, but much more Okay, so I'm not talking about you, but I, no, I can no. tell you that my brain is most of the time is not doing anything interesting, right? It's, well, the, it's the most boring thing in the in That's the, true. Yeah. That's it's, absolutely true. And, and that 1.5 watt is just to keep you alive. When you're thinking, you exactly, actually make exactly. about 1.51 exactly. watt. So, 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 so it's really tiny, the extra energy that we use to be smart. So, so when I was talking, how many, how many watts do what I consume? I felt very hot. <laughs> 25 calories per day, you talk for half an hour, so maybe so 200 calories. And what did I do? Almost nothing, right? I was basically <laughs> recitating something that I had learned in the past, yeah. right? But I think that you are saying that if you, our brain had to do the same amount of operation exactly. that it the would, computer does, yeah. it would consume a lot more energy. But it does the same okay, results. So, 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 I can recognize but, vision better than a computer. Or like a computer. Computer. So, but the computer now recognizing vision takes almost no time. So it basically, you know, once you train a neural net, it basically right. takes no time to evaluate it. It's, it's very, very, very fast. And it's not big. I mean, it's very, very fast. A computer vision system is actually extremely fast at this point. It didn't used to be that way. But no, a computer vision system is like, ooh. I mean, it doesn't take any time. You run this thing. I mean, it's just a simple propagation of values, right? So you can so, see limiting the energy. Like, I can drive mm -hmm. using very little energy. Why? Yeah, but, but <laughs> driving is like the most, you know, low cognitive. It's a very low yeah, cognitive. Yeah, and that's why, why I'm choosing. I, I, I use no skill at all to drive. Yeah. I can use subconsciously almost like everyone or yeah. riding a bike. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but I will still guess that my brain will use less energy than a computer at that point. And I wonder whether this will limit the scaling of 
AI. I think it's a very anything. interesting question. My, I don't think so because I think okay. if you train, if you train a system so that it does very. So the key point is that can it can it do? I mean, we don't we don't know if it can do all the things that you do, obviously, right? Sure. So, but but I think for the simple tasks that we know you do as well or at the same level as a computer, I think it's basically. It's, it, it, I don't think there is a very big difference, but I think Ricardo wants to say something. Yeah, yeah. I want to I say. I don't know if it works, we're just passing it like, yeah, uh, okay. like, just a, a, symbol, like, like a, a symbol. Like a symbol of one speaks. And uh, you know what? Like it. it makes us look very good. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to say that in this discussion, there is uh, some uh, leftover of anthropocentrism, the one that I mentioned before. Let me explain. I mean, a computer, in order to make uh, face recognition, has to uh, solve an equation, has to do mathematical operation. And that's the, the way the computer achieves that uh, outcome. We don't do that in that way. We do it in, in a different way. But in order to model what our brain does, we uh, do that by means of a mathematical operation. If we had to recognize faces by means of solving um, the same mathematical operation, we would be hopeless. No, so we are like, I made the example of if we throw a ball, the ball is not solving the, the gravity equation in order to get on the other side. It's just uh, <coughs> doing what it does because it's a physical system that it does what it does. Likewise, we have a physical biological system that we, we're not a computer that is uh, emulating ourselves in order to recognize faces. We're just being uh, selected by natural evolution as a physical system. So that's why here there's, a, a, in my understanding, there's a disagreement. You're both right. <laughs> because you say that we can uh, drive the car and we don't consume a lot of uh, power to do that. But likewise, the ball is not consuming any power to compute its trajectory. You're saying that the, a computer would need, is a lot more efficient if it would solve <laughs> that problem by the way it does. So I think you're both right. Once right, so you dismiss the way that you do that in a completely different way. So you're saying, we don't know whether, no, I can, I can predict where the ball will fall if I launch it, but I may not do that by solving a dynamic system for the equation that controls this one. My brain will just imply or implement the algorithm when the neural evolution is implemented in me and, and I do that very efficiently. And, and that's what you're saying. But if you had to do it by math, then maybe the two things will not go, uh, you will not be the fastest. So, so let, let, me let me tell you two things. So everybody of you know who John Voinorman was, right? Yeah. So, so, so uh, and there is this story about John Voinorman where, you know, you have the two people, you know, living 70 miles from each, 70 kilometers from each other. One is traveling at 50 kilometers an hour. The other one is 20 kilometers an hour. And the, 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 uh, the fly is moving from the nose of one person to the nose of the other person and vice versa. And so they meet after an hour. Yeah, so they, are, yeah, they meet after an hour. So you have to compute, uh, uh, you know, how long the, 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 the fly has, has traveled. And obviously, you know, uh, you know if, if you know the speed, you don't, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to compute the integral. And they ask the, the so you can say an hour, right? So something like, or 70 kilometers or something like this, 50 kilometers or something. And so the, the, they, they asked John Von Neumann to, to, to ask that question, and Von Neumann replied almost instantly. And they asked Von Neumann, oh, you, know, you knew the trick. And he said, what do you mean you knew the trick? I just computed the geometric series. <laughs> so, so he was actually so fast that he could do this thing very, very fast, like no, woman, no human being could do, because his brain was actually, he had the, probably the fastest brain that ever existed in, 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 in some fields of mathematics. So I think first it's relative, right? So you don't know. Some people will be very, very good at this math with very low consumptions because their brain is hired wired to do this, right? So that's one thing, that's one response. The other thing that I wanted to tell you, so this is relative depending on people. The other thing that I wanted to tell you is that the brain in a sense is, a, is what I would call a reinforcement learning machine, right? So we learn things and then we adapt some of the chemistry inside the brain to store some information or not. So the brain is continuously learning. So while you are, you're saying that your brain is not doing anything, we are still, you know, yeah. constituently learning. And we have been, and some of this is now, you know, has been passed through evolution and so on. So, so I think, you know, it, it's very, you are comparing things that cannot really be compared because evolution has actually brought us to, to where we are. And, and we have a, you know, reasonably efficient brain, which is already pre-trained for so many things, right? So, you know, one of the things that I joke about is that, you know, I don't know if this is true in Europe, but when you are in the U.S., 
and when you, you are expecting a baby, you get these, these books, what do you expect when you're pregnant? And then what do you expect in the first three weeks? What do you expect in the first three months? And people read this because they, have, you know, they need to know that they're going to do the right thing. And then you read this thing and then your kids is doing whatever is in this book. And it's, just, it's so depressing because you think that your kids is different from every other kid. But they say, at three months, the kid is going to do this. At six months, and then it's almost right, right? So we've, within an interval. So this is like depressing, right? But this is all the things that we have been, we are built, you know, built in inside our brain. We have all these things that we will do at a certain point. So I think, you know, you have to compare things that I can be compared. When a neural net is trained, it's very, very efficient. The training process is where we spend the CPU time right now. That's much less you know, efficient, but you have to compare that to evolution in the, that many million of years that you were talking about before, right? So I think comparing these things is not completely fair. No, I agree, I agree. And uh, just to the von Neumann story, uh, we don't know whether we solve math in binary computation. So we don't have we don't idea know. about yeah. brain algorithm for solving uh, near regular arithmetic is yeah. so, and it would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe maybe it could help. <laughs> oh yeah, I think I think so. So so my my point, and yeah. I, I make that point all the time, is that it's very important to actually study neuroscience. I mean, sure. because we have to understand the brain better see if we want to do better engineering system. Just from a purely engineering standpoint, the brain is a very efficient machine in some aspect, right? Yeah, yeah. In other aspect, it's less efficient than a computer, but it has it has things that are really unique and very efficient. The, you know, the vision system is amazing, right? So, and it yeah. works like not the best in the natural. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to the danger of repeating myself, <laughs> but as a philosopher, to point out that in this discussion, but not only in this discussion, but usually when we deal with the brain, with cognitive science, with computers and the like, we keep running into the risk of uh, anthropomorphizing what we are talking with. So, for example, you said that our brain, our brain implemented algorithm. Sure. You said that our brain store information, mm -hmm. and before sure. you said that our brain sees an image. So basically, we first we had the subject, and then we took a piece of the subject, that we, namely the brain, and we attributed to that piece of the subject the property of the subject. I mean, this kind of uh, uh, explanation has been defined a neurological fallacy by two philosophers and the neuroscientists, Bennett and Hacker, in a book called The, the uh, Philosophy of Neuroscience. The neurological fallacy consists in attributing to a part the property of the whole, and then to suggest that that's provide an explanation. So we don't know, how do we see the world? Well, that's the explanation. It's the brain that sees the world. But does that explain how the brain sees the world? No. It just shifts the problem to a part of our body without giving any actual explanation as to why a bunch of cells should see anything. And let me just put it this way. I mean, it's interesting that we see the world differently. So you're uh, colorblind to some extent, I don't know. I'm probably, I'm not, although I also make mistakes with color, so I, I must not see the color like everyone else either. But I mean, my, the point is, information is colorless. So once we take that the computing system takes information, which I would, dis uh, I would disagree with that too, but let's for a moment uh, admit that <laughs> the, the computer or the brain receives information. Information is colorless. <clears throat> so how does the brain know that the information is about color or whatever? So, so I think you, I, there are two things that you need to distinguish. First. There is the input, right? So the input, what, what you get as an input is the same as what I, I get as an input. Whether it's uh, yeah, light voice. or it's sound, we get the same input. So we get an input which is kind of a frequency of color, right? So a frequency of what we call color. But we get a frequency, a physical phenomena. We, you get that, I get that. The difference between you and I is that I cannot interpret that. I don't. My physical cells somewhere are defectuous, and I don't. I cannot recognize some of these frequencies. Okay, so that's a, that's the input. So the input is really a physical system. Now the color blue doesn't exist. A kit does. You know that's what we give the name of some physical phenomena, and we have to learn that concept. It doesn't exist really, but we learn that you know your shirt is what is pink or blue or it's blue. kind of blue, right? So we learn when we are kids. To, to, that this is blue. But what you see and what I see is very different. 
we have the yeah. same name for something, right. but you see it differently than, than I do. So I'm not saying that this color exists or not. That's a name that we give to go. something. But, but still, you and I have the same input. We get the same input, and we process that input inside the brain to actually give a name to something that we see. Yeah, well, I would distinguish between giving a name and having an experience of a color. So we learn names. We don't learn what we see. It's not that because uh, I, I learn a certain color language, I see certain colors. I see colors independently of what I learn how to call them. I mean, in the 70s, there had been a yeah, lot of yeah, researchers yeah, yeah. tried to link uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. language to color, but yeah. then all those experiments yeah. uh, have led to <coughs> nowhere. So we, what we see doesn't depend on, on what... There is, how a we concept. Call it. You, there is a concept that you have learned, that I have learned, right, but to the which concept, we give a name. Yeah, but the concept doesn't lead to my experience. My experience of the color is <coughs> independent of concept. There yeah, seems to be no true. cognitive uh, penetration from concept to color perception. And the other point is that you said that our input is the same, but I would disagree with that. Because uh, uh, due to some difference in your uh, eyes or your retina, your receptors, the frequencies that are causally active with my body are different from the frequencies that are causally active with your body. So the your body, your brain is different. No, no, but, but what, you, what comes into your brain is the same thing as what comes into my brain. No, that's, the, that's I, I agree with you. No, 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 but what, when it yeah. comes to the retina, or when it comes just, you know, when it's about to come to my <laughs> eye, that is the same for you and I. Yeah, and then, 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 then I have a physical system. I mean, my sensors are not the same as your sensors. And then afterwards, the way we interpret this sensor is different. But, the, but when it's about to hit the sensor, you and I get the same thing. But what it's about, that's very well put, what it's about to hit your sensor yeah. is immaterial to what goes through. What it matters is what it's really able to produce an effect because of your uh, uh, eye structure. Yeah. So there are plenty of frequencies here, UVA, UVB, infrared, yeah, yeah. which uh, are Absolutely. neutrinos, which are unable to produce any effect. So yeah. I would say that uh, the, the, the causal properties of your body uh, single out, singles out a, a subset of physical properties in the external world. And such a subset is different in your case and in my case. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I so the difference is outside, not inside. Oh, what do you mean? I mean, the signal is the same outside, and then when it enters, it may be different. But Let me put it this way. We are moving, so I'm shifting with another example. We are moving on the highway. You're driving at 80 kilometers per hour. I'm driving at 60 kilometers per hour. There's a truck. The truck is relative to the ground, moving at 100 kilometers per hour. The truck has a relative velocity relative to you of, uh, say, 20, relative to me, yeah. 40. Where is the relative velocity of the truck? Is it inside our car or your car, or is it in the truck? Is it the property of the truck, or is it the property of your body? I mean, the difference in your vehicle and my vehicle makes a difference in the external world. Likewise, because, say, I have three kinds of photoreceptors, and you have two kinds of photoreceptors, yeah. we single out in the external world Two different classes of frequencies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I may point out a difference in the external world. I don't need to have an interpretation after the sensors. I can point out a difference in the external world. So you're filtering the external world to some extent. Exactly. So your... I'm picking up apples. You're picking up uh, uh, yeah. pears. But that's because there are apples and pears in the external world, not because yeah. they pick up. We both pick up. Uh, Oranges and you interpret them as pears and I interpret them as apples. I like apples. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have uh, six thirty as a as a time limit. Uh, yes, I have. I mean, if we also, we can also go a bit further. Right. No, no. Are we going to give big? No. Anyone? Can you just ask questions? Sure. Yeah. 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 I have a question. Go on. Plenty of right. questions. First, it went first, so <laughs> you go first. And, then and he course. deserves it. Yeah, he deserves <laughs> it. From an external standpoint. Go ahead. A simple question for you okay. uh, about okay. hibernation. Sure. And what is the effect of hibernation uh, with longer plumbers and huh. aging? Right, very and interesting. Another question for Professor Manzotti. Uh, what is the relationship between the theory of mind and consciousness? And how does how do those theories change uh, if we take into account Nick, Nick Armstrong's claims about, you know, superintelligence and, uh, 
the fact that we may live in a simulation. Nice. So hibernation, telomeres, and aging. So aging slows down during hibernation very much. It should almost stop, and it can go even further. There are a few species, among which the edible dormice, who is able to re-elongate the telomeres during hibernation. So someone is speaking about reverse aging. And, and that's pretty good, apparently, <laughs> to live. But yes, you live, as a general rule, the, the lower is the energy you spend and you use to live, the longer you will live. So one day as a lion and a number of days as a lizard, more than a, than a sheep. So we should not be exercising. I always advocate against, but that's my <laughs> person. <laughs> don't take me, don't take me out of that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. First of all, uh, I just wanted to invite everyone to check my my website. I didn't say before, but or just to write me if you have any objection, anything. I'm just working on this uh, theory, so and you're all super brilliant students. So I look forward to any objections. Just an invitation to everyone. So about uh, uh, Nick Bostrom and about the theory of mind. Um, you mean the theory of mind of other? You mean minds. the dome, the theory of other minds. Uh, about Nick Bostrom's. Yeah. And I was speaking about his uh, claims about the, the, that we're most likely living in a simulation. Okay, so let me get to the massive simulation hypothesis, basically. Um, as I said before, we have no real evidence that that kind of simulation that Nick Bostrom suggested, and it is taken for granted by philosophers of mind, is, actual, is an actual possibility, namely the magic scenario. The massive simulation hypothesis works only if we could provide um, a pure virtual experience of reality. That, there's no evidence of that. As I made the example uh, before that nobody... Have you ever seen a virtual color in a machine? Have you ever heard a virtual sound? No, because when you put on a, a reality device, a head-mounted display or whatever, you have a virtual reality helmet, you have actual colors projecting against your retina, you have actual sound in, close to your ears. Has anyone ever plugged in a USB cable into someone's brain to produce a completely novel experience? What about brain simulation, direct cortical stimulation? Yeah, yeah, Very good example. So the, the, this notion all started when Penfield in the 50s yeah. started to make that kind of experiment. I went through all the literature about Penfield, I read all the, the there's a beautiful book by Penfield called The Brain and the Electrode, and a much more boring uh, book by Penfield where there are 600 reports by his patient. He recorded them all and he printed them all, it's a very thick book. And after Penfield, of course, we had umpteen experiment, a lot less invasive today with uh, uh, transmagnetic stimulation and the like, I mean, it was very fashionable. Has there ever been just one report of something really unusual, of a new color, of a new taste, of a new situation, of a new geometry, of something that but people how, how say? Could you be they would say, color, like well, one would say, I saw a color, I don't have a name for it, I, I really would like to have a name, but I don't. But that color in the, my dream was not anything I saw before. It was something I never seen before. That would be enough to suggest that there is something, or just to... And so, by the way, if you check those, those reports and you see the, those hallucinations, they're all like that. Oh, yes, I see my mom. She's speaking with me in my room. I see my friends in the dorms where I was studying 20 years ago. There are people in the hallway. They're hanging their, word, their, their coats on the wardrobe. I, see, I, I listen to music that uh, I was listening when I was a child or something like that. So all of those reports are just a massive reshuffling of previous experiences. And even afterward, all hallucination. Take all cases of hallucination. Charles Bonnet, th think about your dreams. Yeah, but let me ask you a provocative question, an yeah, imaginary experiment. If I were to raise a child without exposing him to the color red, let's say, right. would you ex ex think that he will dream of red? He, he will know the existence of this color? Would that be something that you could evoke by stimulating his, his, uh, his occipital cortex? And then he would say, hey, I never saw this color, yeah. or not. Well, let me ask a question, too. We have That's a color of <laughs> no, 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 let me ask a question, because we have a real case here. Have you been, uh, have you been color blind? Are you, 
the congenitally colorblind, or yeah, yeah, did yeah. you develop? Uh, no, no, I was uh, I was born that way. I mean, as far as I can tell. Okay, so, so, you, so, so you know the experience, right? So they, they show you this. When you are a yeah, kid, they show numbers. you this, these numbers. Exactly. And then they show me a couple of numbers that I recognize. And then they show me something and say, you're joking, there is no number. I say, of course, there is a number. There is no number. And exactly. There was, there was so, no number, so you were aware because people told you that there were more colors than the one that you perceived. So the key, point is that, tell you, no, 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 the key point is that at some point, you know, you, you have to, when you are a kid, you are coloring trees, right? So, and yes. I was coloring the trunk green and the right. flow and the, and the, and the leaves uh, green. Is this the opposite? No, brown, the leaves right. are brown. <laughs> and then the, yeah. the trunk was green. And so people looked at this and say, oh, well, you, you are, you know, trying to be an impressionist or something. <laughs> but, but, but exactly. No, I mean, so I you, knew, you knew that you were not perceiving colors like everyone else. No, people, people told, me, told people you. Told because people told you. They told me. So why didn't you perceive, why didn't you dream of the colors that you haven't seen in your life? Why? I mean, I assume that your color blindness is probably due, I, I don't no, know no. you, but it's probably due to your retina, not due yeah, yeah, to yeah, your yeah, brain. Retina, so, yeah, why right. didn't your brain uh, develop? Because I don't get the signals. I, get, I just don't get the signals. So, I mean, you I, needed the contact with the external world. So, so look, look, this would be interesting. So, yeah. so if, I, if I replace my, uh, my sensors yeah. by something that can actually distinguish this sensor, I would see the colors like you do. I mean, like, like yeah, probably the normal people. Color. So, if I take your eyes, put it in the mind, Oh, your retina, exactly. including mine. If you are willing to do that, we can try. <laughs> <laughs> but that would mean that. Then, then, I, then I will see. Then I will see like you and my brain is probably ready to do that because I mean the, yeah. the, the my brain is the same as far as the as the vision system. Your brain, well, your brain and my brain are probably the same. Right. I just I just don't have the right input. Exactly. But he was for, talking about for, dreams for for a, for a certain. But so, so that means that if somebody could activate, okay. So but this is very yeah. good because we are making progress here. If you could activate the sensors in my brain that never gets activated, I would see the colors as you do. If we could, if we could have a, an implant there, I would say, hey, I'm correcting this. I would see colors that I have never seen. Yeah. But not because you would be receiving colors inside your brain. Because you would agree with me that the signals that would move from your eye to your brain would be colorless. The signal, the signal that's coming is a, is basically frequency. I, it's a it's a it's a number, right? So, so at some your, point it's a number. To your brain, I so, think, from the from the retina to the brain. I mean, from the retina to the, the, to the key point. The, the, the key brain. point that I would say is that you are basically in your brain somewhere in your dreams. Your dreams have to be able to simulate inside your brain the fact that you see green because you have seen green. I don't see green. And therefore, my brain is never able to simulate this because it never seen this. It never stole that information anywhere. And so I think, you know, if, if you actually stimulate this, I would see green. And I would be like, oh, okay. So if, so we, add, if we add more, because in nature there are, anyway, there are 16 and even more optical, optical sensors. So we could engineer the exactly. eye to see right. color you, that we never seen. Exactly. If we have well, the, as long as the brain is developing, because you can, I don't know if you can do that now, but for sure when you're... Uh, in yeah, a certain yeah. age. So, so, so you, you the new colors for everyone in human in humankind would be you, you would have to adapt your brain to that. Yeah, I would not because my brain is the, probably exactly. you know, the visual system is the same, so, so I would see the same thing as you do. So here we have an empirical uh, prediction between my theory and the standard view. Exactly. The empirical prediction is the following. Let's suppose that we have two patients. We have, we have, you have uh, Pascal. Okay. okay. Sure. There are two possibilities. First possibility, we gave Pascal my eyes or a device with three kinds of photoreceptors. Uh, this is scenario A. Scenario B, case, uh, case B, we uh, trigger uh, uh, Pascal's brain with the same kind of information, yeah. only it is not generated by an actual eye, yeah. but it's generated by a computer. Okay. According to my theory, in the scenario A, Pascal would see the colors, because the colors would be outside. In the second scenario, <coughs> according to my theory, Pascal would not see any color, because he would receive colorless information. It could go both ways, because if, if he needs to be exposed to the color at least once to have that, that string, that, that neural network present in his brain, when we're stimulating his brain, we will not activate the object we want to activate. So somehow, it, it, I, what I claim is that it may be impossible to see a color that you have never seen. 
or never experience. Well, it, it, I, I think, I'm not sure if it's possible. It's I, possible. I think what it would, it would make, I think what, what, if I had to speculate, right, so we can yeah. speculate today, right? Sure. If I had to speculate, it would take me a long time before I recognize green, because my brain is not trained to see green. And so a child, you know, before yeah, the I mean, child will too. have to get green and then develop inside right. his brain this green. I would take as much time, if you start putting an implant that actually recognizes green for me, I would take a long time before I can actually yeah, see could what this is. You put a nasocortex on his brain, and which will cap maybe all the, all the frequency of light, and his cortex will learn that, We learn to recognize it. I don't know what name we'll give to this kind of thing, but he could learn to move himself in the environment like a bat using ultrasound eventually. I think the brain is such a plastic machine, it's like a mole, that every kind of input you put in it, it, it just train, it's just built to pattern recognition, pretty much. Yeah. And, and you try to patternize That's what good. we see. I don't really agree with that, but I think we need to distinguish between recognizing bread and experiencing bread. Yeah. Um, recognizing any external phenomena might take place, it's a functional problem. It might take sure. place without any consciousness involved. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, the, the problem of conscience is not about how much time does it take to recognize sure. a color. It's about why should we have an experience of color no, that's at the very end. And uh, I don't think that the functional description of learning is providing us with any explanation of the fact that we have an experience of red. Because everything might take place like in a zombie. Yeah. We may do all yeah. our... Rec like machines do. Actually, machines are the, the, the good analogy for the zombie. They do things without knowing they do things. So why do we know things? Why do we experience the world rather than just being a functional uh, <coughs> processor? And the explanation may be that we are not the functional processor, but we are the external world that is acting <coughs> on the processor. Oh, yeah. We are not the brain that is uh, having an experience of the world. We are the world that by means of the brain is doing things. So if I were put it in quantum mechanics, the, the function, the, the wave function of the world will collapse in my, inside my brain, giving rays to reality. Right. I don't know if that was... And we would be the <laughs> wave function rather than right. being the brain. All right. There were more questions over here than I guess we'll have to close shortly. Uh, it's for uh, So, uh, you were talking earlier about uh, how uh, we don't, we do not store information and just experience uh, uh, items, objects that are outside in the world. Uh, so we can, for example, experience the energy. Uh, but uh, what happens uh, to these experiences? Uh, how how uh, mm, how do we work uh, when uh, we? remove the, the apple, we move it outside the room or we destroy the apple. We, how, how do we remember something that's no longer there if we don't do not store information? And how, how can we conceive something that doesn't, that doesn't yet exist? Yeah, yeah, that's very clear. And actually, this is the problem that uh, I've been working more in order to find a solution. And uh, I think, uh, well, I, I will squeeze a very uh, long problem, and I will say, to, to answer to this question, we just apply physics. Why do I mean that? I just make an example. For a moment, I play the devil's advocate. Let's suppose that I'm a brain. So I, take, I buy the notion that I'm, a, I'm my brain. I'm a brain that sees, hears everything, thinks everything. Now, when I think, when I do the, the shortest uh, um, empirically uh, detectable uh, um, neural process that leads to some kind of uh, conscious experience, my brain has to work for at least, uh, from, uh, for at least 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. Below that threshold, uh, there doesn't seem to be anything uh, conscious. We can argue empirically whether it is 35 milliseconds or whether it is uh, 300 milliseconds. But there's a threshold. There's a threshold. So let, let me assume 150 milliseconds just for the sake of the argument. Well, because of the speed uh, of the neural signals in the brain, uh, my, 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 my neural signal, it uh, covers roughly uh, 15 meters. Because more or less it's 10 meters every, every 100 milliseconds. So that, that is just due to the way in which the brain works, just sending neural <coughs> signals that have to travel along axons. 
So 150 milliseconds is 50 meters. Only we are not aware of that usually in our conversation because they're all wrapped up in the brain. So they seem to be just in one place. But actually, if we could see them, if we could unravel the brain and see just a long neural network uh, laid uh, on the ground, that would be a 50 meters long for, for the shortest uh, mental processes. For longer mental processes, it would be hundreds of meters long. And it would also require time. So what keeps together the last neural spike with the first neural spike? Nothing. If we were a computer, there would be an enormous amount of time. So this is to say that we usually have a simplistic notion that we are in one place at one time. But if we relax that notion and we conceive that we are actually spread in space-time, even if we were a brain, then we can take into consideration even larger space-time framework. So, to cut a long story short, my point is that when I, the apple is no longer here, and I'm still thinking about the apple, it's because the apple that was here five minutes ago is still at the beginning of a causal chain that my brain is at the end of it. So, my point is that, or just to, to give you one other example, then I, I draw to a conclusion. When we look at the sun, we see the sun that is here now. No, but is that sun in our present? Yes, it is. And then we say, we don't see the sun. We see the light of the sun. But if we take that rational, we don't see anything. We only see the light. But we don't see the light either, because there's time between the light and the rhodopsin release in the, in the retina. And we don't see the rhodopsin either, because there's time uh, going by from the retina to the brain. So. My point is that we need to reconsider the space-time structure of our existence, and by doing that we can reconsider memory, dream, and hallucination as kinds of perception. So can I disagree? Yeah, please. <laughs> so so let, let, let me give you the other answer to this question. So, and I'm, gonna, I, I'm, a, I'm a computer scientist, so one of the things that I used to teach is computer architecture. A computer, a computer system has three, three or four kinds of gates, AND gate, OR gate, XOR gate, and so on. They are functions. So if you give them input, they have an output. And so how does a computer actually have a memory? Okay, so that's an interesting question. So and what I teach my students is that you have this function, and then you can combine them in such a way that they memorize things. If you have a loop inside your system, if you loop these gates together, you can store one bit of information. And so in a sense, to the, I, think, I think you ask, have you ever seen one bit of information? Yes, I have. I mean, I can, uh, well, I mean, conceptually. This is just a sequence of gates that basically you need two gates, two, in, two inverter gates, and you have one piece of information that you, can, that you can set up, that you can read, that you can store. So there is at least one interpretation where your brain has some cycle in there, like the you know, recurrent normal, you know, network, where you can store information. Now, how does that happen? You know, from what I know in neuroscience, and I told you I know nothing, but some of the things that we have is that we have some chemicals in the brain, and when they actually accumulate to a certain level, then you will actually build connections. So you could actually store information that way in the brain. Now, I know the computer science part, and I know you can store information in a computer. You know, I think you can do exactly the same thing in the brain. Yeah, I, I just a quick I, follow. I, I, okay. I think we need to go to the next question, otherwise okay, it's out of the road. But we, we, we can agree to disagree, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, our, that's our, our job. Room. Exactly, that's <laughs> a job. Yeah, that's a job. Pluralism, right? Right, so I have two tiny questions as well. Um, the first one is for you, and I just wanted to ask, what happens since we started from the brain, then we went all the way to the abstract mind, and then we came back to the brain to speak about neurons and the most low-level thing that we can imagine. Uh, I wanted to ask what happens to the brain when uh, it hibernates? Like, how, is it different from sleep? Is it... Uh, so that's my first question. And then my second question is for all of you, uh, which is, uh, how do you get where you got? Like, what is the uh, academical study path that I should follow to get where each one of you is? <laughs> Okay. Well, I'm gonna go. For, let's take the first part out, and uh, we have time for the second part. Um, brain changes <coughs> dramatically. The brain changes dramatically. Is very state of hibernation is very different from sleep. Very, very different from coma or general anesthesia or uh, rest or any other state you can think of. REM or non-REM sleep. 
Um, the structural this general function of the EEG, the, how the shape of the EEG, let's put it that way, is strongly resemble the one we have when we're awake. But it's much, much slower. It's like, sometimes I think, if I can imagine and, and see it in my mind, I imagine a movie uh, with, with slower and slower frames, time after time, almost then stopping. So that should give you a feeling of time extension somehow or, or, or time slowing down. Uh, the physical changes even more because synapses are going to um, reabsorb. So the hibernation is a state for save energy. So the most consuming part of the energy in the brain is the synapses. And so it makes total sense that synapses get reabsorbed. And you express a lot of proteins that are very common in, in uh, like Alzheimer's disease. Sometimes I say it is like diving in dementia for the time you're hibernated. Uh, but then you come out. You come out very fast and clear your brain from, and change the brain structure, really physically change it, and rebuild all the synapses you have, sometimes actually a little more, and apparently you are even better performed after. So uh, that's open a lot of other questions, like how our memory, what does it mean, the true meaning of synapses for a memory circuit, for instance, is that they're important, are they built in the same, no one knows if they're rebuilt in the same place, the same strength, or there are different synapses, more or less around. And uh, so it opens an interesting an interesting field for, for studying this kind of thing. And it's really new. Coming back to your final question, you have an order that you can start. You're feeling like giving a, an advice? Yeah. Once my ex-wife, uh, <laughs> watching at everything I, I mean, I've done, I said, you know, from philosophy to computer science or whatever, she summarized that. Um, to avoid to work, you've done really everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then, uh, what we can add? You can speak in, a, in an off microphone, then. That's also interesting. No, you, so it's your, your question is a true question, and for you it's actually really important. So I think there, there unfortunately, at the moment, there are... There are paths, there are kind of um, institutional, institutionalized. So there, there, there are clear paths that you can take to science. What I believe you're asking is, are those paths going to take me where I'm going to go, where I'm going to go to some kind of frontier, something that is new and I like to it? And there is no answer to this question, as, as there is no clear way to do it. And unless you're using your time very wisely, um, ask anyone you know, uh, in the place where you may like to go, how does he, how is the life there? Let's say you want to go to that lab, then ask uh, people that work there, how, how is your life, are you happy? Ask people that left that lab, uh, what, are, what are they doing? Are they working the same field, are working on something different? Uh, did they have a career, did they don't have a career? Um, ask them what is their, their actual downsides of life. I have students that are usually really attracted by uh, neuroscience, and, and therefore they go into neurology or psychiatry. And, and sometimes I, 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 I don't do that for a while, but I did it in the past. I take it out to dinner with friends that are actually neurologists or psychiatrists uh, to let them understand what that job is. Doing, being a neurologist doesn't mean studying neuroscience. There are two different things. The work of a neurologist is an actual job. You have to do things that you may not really like when you think that the brain as this magical box that you want to study. And psychiatry is even worse. Uh, so once you know the downsides of your job or the, your career, then you can take this also into account. It's OK to work at night, maybe even exi exciting to work at night in the hospital and, and do emergency and stuff when you're 25, when you're 30. When you're 55 and you have a family and you have other things, it's not that exciting to be called for an emergency surgery in the night. So this, uh, thing to consider personally, like uh, how, how much am I willing to put out of my life? How long can I wait before I have a, a job, a secure job, or something that can guarantee me a decent life? Am I willing to do 15 years of unstable job, <coughs> passing from lab to lab? Uh, all those kind of questions you have to ask yourself very deeply, and in order to, under, to see what you're willing to do to reach your, your dream, or, or what your ambitions are. And once you are clear what you want to do and what you want to study and what is the risk you're willing to take, then just find the place where, where you can eventually do 
call the person, write an email, knock at this door. Most of the time they will open the door and they will talk to you and, and you may find more open door than what you think. That's, that's my experience. All right, so I don't think I'm an example, but I can tell you a story. Uh, so first, uh, the only thing that I wanted to do uh, when I was young, be a soccer star. So I was last in my high school. I was playing soccer all the time. That's the only thing that I was doing. I, I was doing other things, but I wanted to be a soccer star. So when I started university, uh, I didn't know what to do. So uh, my mother was very stubborn, told me, okay, do economics. At least you will make some money at some point. So I started <laughs> economics. And you go to economics, and then you, they teach you first a particular theory. So let's say Keynes. And I say, oh, this is pretty good, you know, consistent, nice, mm, nice. And then the next week, they start with another theory, let's say Friedman. And then you see this theory, oh, this is very nice. I like it. But then you realize that this is just the opposite of what the other guy has said. And I was like, what, what are we learning here? I mean, this, is, this has no sense. And so I switched to computer science. And so I really, because at least you know what you're doing, right? And so I liked it a lot, and it was, and I just, I just, you know, love it so much that I was working all the time, coding all the time, day and night, so you know. And then uh, my mother, was, as I told you, very stubborn, doesn't want us to work very hard. So eight to five, she can do things other than that. So I had to find a way to actually work. And I was telling her that, you know, I was, you know, the, the computer that we worked on at that point was called Sophia. I said, oh, I'm going to see Sophia. So she was Sophia was my girlfriend, and I had no girlfriend at that point. But then I, you know, I got a, girl, a girlfriend, and sometimes I would go and see her in the evening. And I say, oh, I'm going to see, uh, I'm going to see, uh, let's say, give me another name. So you that I, the name I, no, I know the name, but I'm not going to. It's a French name. So let's say I'm, I'm going to see, I'm going to see Maria, okay? And then my mother had said, oh, I thought you were with Sophia. Oh, well, Sophia was before. No, it's Maria. <laughs> So I think that I, I really fell in love with computers and spent a lot of time doing this. It was fun. And then I wanted to do research in this to pull their technology and so on. But the only thing that I can tell you is that, and so uh, I think what you have to do is something that, that you like to do. And that's the only thing. I mean, I don't have uh, any problem getting up in the morning. That's what I tell my students. If you want to work with me, you know, the first thing that you have to do is love what you do. If you don't love it, find somebody, somebody else. I mean, you have to be passionate about your work. You want to, it's, it shouldn't be difficult to get up. I mean, it should be the best time of the, of the day. You can start a new day and, and start doing interesting things. It doesn't mean that you have to do the same thing, you know, otherwise. I, you know, I think physics is very interesting. You know, I learned power system. I knew nothing about it. This is beautiful as well. I think you just do things and try to do a lot of different things. But once again, I'm probably not a very good example because I work too hard. But uh, <laughs> I just love doing this and, you know, uh, and, and knowing a little bit of every topic, even philosophy. So I read the book of Harari as well, and I love that because you learn something different all the time. So I think it, I mean, yeah, but I get excited almost about everything. So when my daughter talks about medicine and so on, I'm asking her all the questions because it's also, it's like a computer, right? So you want to find out, you want to understand how the body works. At least I, I want, she doesn't want to, but you know, <laughs> at least I want to understand everything. So, you know, be passionate about what you want and it's going to be fine. I wanted to say, yeah, thank you very much for staying with us up to now. So thank you again.